Uh, we'd like to especially welcome our young guests from Crocker Farm, their principal, their parents, their teacher, and we will be hearing from them very early on in the program. So, at 6.30, we're calling the meeting to order, seeing that we have a quorum of the council present. Um, I would like to have the first slide, and if you look up here, several of you, meaning my fellow councillors, have been suggesting we begin being a little more strict on time. And so I challenge you this evening, if you look up here, and if you follow this, and you keep your remarks brief, but pointed, we might actually get out of here before midnight. So, um, I'm going to try to keep us to this schedule. It's very aggressive, but I understand the rules of procedure are planning to ask for something aggressive like this anyway. So, uh, let's move on. First of all, uh, a couple things I'd like to note on your calendar. The May 4th, we have a cleanup of Amherst. It's an event that's both counselors and our community participation officers and others are participating in. And if those of you sitting here tonight that are under 18, if you'd like to participate, you have to bring your parents with you, okay? Uh, second of all, on May 21st at 6.30 p.m., we have a finance committee public hearing on the FY20 budget. And then finally on June 10th at 6.30 p.m., we have a public forum on, capital, on the capital improvement plan. As I mentioned earlier, I'm going to change, take the liberty of changing the order, order of the agenda, and we will hear from the Crocker Farm Read Around Town Project book box. And after that, we will have time for public comment and move on through the rest of the agenda as it has been laid out. So with that, I would especially like to ask Ms. Kate Perkins, who is the teacher of this wonderful class, to come forward. Hi. I live on Station Road. Thank you so much for um, inviting us tonight. And without further ado, I'd like to present the fabulous third graders. My name is Sophie and I live on 57 Glendale Road. Reason one, people who are, who are learning to read need to read for, have their eyes on text for 20 minutes every day and a bus ride is a perfect time. and I go to Crocker Farm. Reading every, reading, reading for 20 minutes every day builds up your brain. I'm Clara and I live on 30 Orchard Street. Here is some research on reading and brain development. Why read 20 minutes at home? You can read this later. My name is Lucia and I live on Spring Street. Reason two, little free libraries at bus stops will provide easy, convenient access to books for everyone. My name is Morgan and I live on Woodside Ave. Reason three, people are addicted to their phones and often don't know what to do instead. Books could be the answer. What can I possibly do on this bus ride instead of being on my phone? I'm Tim and I live on 16 Whipple Tree Lane. We hope that Read Around Town will get people off their phones and inspire new learning 
and conversations. We hope to offer books for all ages, both fiction and non, and in multiple languages. Reason number four, reading would keep people quiet on the bus so the driver can focus, and this is super important for everyone's safety. We hope that Read Around Town will inspire other communities to join us in our effort to get lots of books into the hands of all their citizens and to get kids involved in local change making endeavors. Now we're skipping forward a little bit. Who will pay for the project and how will they pay for the project? Our class is currently selling our Great Changer cards and proceeds will fund the project. In the past years, our fundraisers have generated $300 to $500. We have already received several money donations in support of the Read Around Town. We have received donations and materials to build the library. These are our beautiful Great Changer cards. Our fundraiser basket in the Crocker Farm office. We are sponsored by UMass 5 College Federal Cre Cre Credit Union with a $250 match. Thanks, UMass 5. Which bus stops will have little free libraries? We would like to install little free libraries at the following bus stops. Bus stop number 200. 21 at West Street and Potline, bus stop number 179 at West Street and Pomeroy, bus stop number 166 at the bottom of the Crocker Farm driveway. This is bus stop number 221 at Potline Drive and West Street. This is bus stop number 179 at Pomeroy Lane and West Street. This is bus stop number 166 at the bottom of the Crocker Farm driveway. These, these are the plans. We're just going to skip right over that part because I know you've had time to look at them. Um, here's the size comparison. We think an average adult is about 5'10", so this is how big a, a library is. So who will build the libraries and install them at the bus stops? Mr. Tom Joyce will, has offered generously to build with our help. We are exploring the idea of reaching out to local scout troops and vocational schools for help with building. Third graders will decorate the library so that they are a source of beauty and pride for our community for many years to come. And class parent and community volunteers will dig holes and add quick concrete so that the libraries are anchored securely in the ground. These are our materials.
My name's John, and I go to Crocker Farm. We hope to add more little free libraries to additional bus stops in town in future years. I'd like to ask counselors if they have any comment or questions at this time. Pat. Um, I have a comment, which I think this is an absolutely wonderful project. Um, but I also have a question. I have a lot of books at home, and how can I get them to the small libraries when I'm in that neighborhood or bring them to the school? You could drop them off at our school. Okay. <laughs> and thank you. <laughs> Are there other questions from the council? Yes, Dorothy. Is there any particular age range? Is this for all, all people or particularly for young phone addicted people? This is for all people. <laughs> all right. Excellent answers. Do we have any other questions or comments? Then I'm going to exert my privilege as president of the council to place the following motion before the council, and I'll be seeking a second. The motion is, oh, Pat. <laughs> Pat wants to second it, I know she does. Uh, okay, the motion is to approve the request of the Crocker Farm Elementary School third grade class to install three five li free little libraries on Amherst Public Ways, one adjacent to bus stop ID number 221 at the corner of Potwine Lane and West Street, Route 116, one adjacent to bus stop 179 at West Street and Pomeroy Lane, and one adjacent to bus ID number 166 on West Street at the bottom of the Crocker Farm driveway. Do I hear a second? Pat, <laughs> is there any further discussion from the council? Then all of those in favor, raise your hand, please. I'd like to note that that is unanimous. We want to thank you for being with us today, and we hope you'll come back for more civic education. Okay? Thank you so much for having us. We are going to continue with our agenda. If you'd like to, if the students and their parents and so forth would like to get home to do their homework, that'd be great. We are going to proceed with general public comment. Uh, as you may note on the agenda, we have several times during the evening that we will be receiving public comment in relationship to agenda items. Specifically, those items are 6A, 6B, 6C, 6D, 7A, 7B, 7C, 7E, and 7H. If you have a comment that you would like to make in regard to any other issue besides those, please uh, raise your hand. 
Yes. Come forward, please. State your name, where you live. My name is John Griffin. I live in Greenfield. I work at UMass Amherst, but I'm here in my personal capacity, not in any official capacity. I would like tonight to tell you about a young man. This young man is 24 years old, computer science graduate student at UMass Amherst with a bright future ahead of him, or at least it was until his life was tragically taken by a motor vehicle on Friday, April 12th on North Pleasant Street. This young man's name was Jasper N. Singh, and his death made headlines internationally in India where he was from originally. It is reported that the driver stopped and cooperated with police, and no charges are being filed. No further news has been published on this locally since the 12th, and it's impossible to find any details on why or how this tragic event happened. It has been 10 days since the crash. Surely the police are able to investigate, investigate a crash where the driver stopped to cooperate and no charges were filed in this amount of time. We should know what happened so that we can prevent it from happening again in the future. Without the details of this accident, we can't know the speed at which the driver was traveling or if they were momentarily distracted by something else in the roadway. But let us assume for a second that the driver was traveling at the posted speed limit of 35 miles per hour, ignoring for now that most people travel at least 45 to 50 miles an hour down this roadway most days. According to a study of pedestrian collisions by ProPublica and the AAA Foundation for Traffic Safety, the average 30-year-old individual has a 22% chance of being killed when struck at 35 miles per hour, which rises to 31% for all ages. Whereas for the same 30-year-old pedestrian, there is only a 7% chance of dying from a collision with a vehicle if that vehicle is traveling at 25 miles per hour, or 12% for all ages. At 20 miles per hour, that risk falls to 3% or 7% for all ages. In other words, your chance of being killed by a vehicle traveling at 25 miles per hour versus 20 doubles, and your chance of being killed by a vehicle traveling at 35 miles per hour compared to 25 miles per hour more than doubles again. North Pleasant Street is a thickly settled residential street with cars, pedestrians, buses, and bicycle traffic. 35 miles an hour is simply too fast. I respectfully urge the Town Council to adopt Massachusetts General Law Chapter 90, Section 17C, which allows Town Councils to, without further authority and without the standard DOT review process, unilaterally change the, ta the statutory speed limit for thickly settled roadways to 25 miles per hour townwide. I also ask the Town Council to establish a 20 mile per hour safety zone, as allowed by Massachusetts General Law Chapter 90, Section 18B for all town owned roadways throughout the UMass Amherst campus and North Pleasant Street in downtown Amherst. According to Mass DOT crash data, a pedestrian was fatally struck and hit in a hit and run accident at North Pleasant Street and Kellogg Avenue in November of 2016. Mr. Singh's death makes two pedestrian deaths in three years, in addition to the numerous injuries that happen on the UMass, Camers, camp, UMass Amherst campus every year. I ask you to help stop the next death before it happens and to adopt lower speed limits in town as other communities are doing under this law, including Boston, Cambridge, Somerville, Concord, Lexington, Lynn, Revere, Salem, as well as Chicopee, Holyoke, Springfield, and Pittsfield, amongst 39 total cities and towns that have adopted MGL 9017C so far. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Are there any other comments at this time? Okay, if not, we'll proceed with the agenda and we will move on to item number five, which is proclamations and commemorations. The first one is on Arbor Month proclamation. Um, is there anyone here to speak to this pr proclamation? Please come forward. Just wanted to thank you for uh, taking this time for the Arbor Day, Arbor Day, Arbor Month proclamation. Okay, thank you. Are there any other comments on this particular proclamation? The counselors have this before them. Yes, Mandy Jo. I had sent some spelling revisions in, just make sure we get them spelled correctly before we sign it. Okay. We will uh, check do a spell check on that and do so before I officially sign it. Don't worry, Margaret, I'll be back tomorrow so I can sign it then. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Um, oh, I'm sorry. 
Are there any other questions this time? All right, then all those in favor of the Arbor Month proclamation. A motion, I'm sorry. Do I hear a motion to accept? Or I to shall move. Please? Thank you. And I'll all matter. those, and the second, and we'll move on. Okay, this is to adopt the Arbor Month proclamation as presented. All those in favor? Okay, that's unanimous. Uh, thank you very much. The next one is Art Week Proclamation, and Sarah LaCour is with us this evening um, uh, to speak on behalf of the Art Week Proclamation. However, we would like to take this opportunity to thank her upon her decision to leave the bid. Um, she has made a significant contribution as executive director of the bid. During her tenure, she's worked diligently on the mission goals and action steps set forward in the bid five-year implementation plan. This work includes bringing new events, programming, and special projects to the organization and the town. And as compared to other bids across the state, we are considered to be one of the strongest bids. During transition times, the transitional time for the Amherst Chamber of Commerce, she took over many of their responsibilities with regard to the visitor center and the taste of Amherst. She stabilized the bid, aiding them to become a true partner in to the town and representing the interests of the downtown businesses and all businesses. She also was enormously successful in obtaining renewal of the bid for the property owners who are required to pay extra to have a bid. This is a mark of a very successful group that are willing to tax themselves more for the services they're receiving. So with that, we're interested in hearing about the grant and Art Week. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. <laughs> Didn't expect that. Thank you. Um, Sarah LaCour, Executive Director of the BID for another five weeks. Um, I'm also wearing another hat, uh, the Amherst Center Cultural District, which is managed by the BID on behalf of the town, and I'm president of that organization. And it's through the Cultural District that we have re we received a grant from the Massachusetts Cultural Council. And one of the things we decided to do with that was uh, a coalescing event and we decided that it would be very um, significant to us to sign on to Art Week Massachusetts, which has been very successful around the state. So this is a week that um, has been happening across the Commonwealth, but we're putting our own twist on it. And so it's Art Week in Amherst, the art of. And we've let businesses and um, organizations and nonprofits go with however they wanted to go with this. And it's been really exciting. We have um, a poster out. We've gotten a lot of press. We have a poster with all the, you'll see, we also have a big sign up at Renz. We have coasters that are out there. Um, and so there's a lot of really, really interesting, diverse events happening. It's April 26th through May 5th. And um, we also got some great press in Boston. We are on the marquee of the Box Center in downtown Boston, our cultural district group. We have a cutout of Emily with us, and we're holding signs. Um, so we're famous in Boston. So we're really, really excited about this project. We hope it to be an annual event um, through the cultural district. And it's been a great way to engage all kinds of sectors uh, throughout downtown. Um, and we're really looking forward to, to having this event happen this year, and we hope many more. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions from the council? Okay. Uh, we have a motion to adopt the Art Week proclamation as presented. And second? Sarah. Okay. It was seconded by Sarah. Are there any further questions or comments? All those in favor? That's unanimous. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. So please come and attend some of our great events. Thanks so much. Great. And our final proclamation is from the VFW Veterans of Foreign War. It's a citation. Is there anybody here representing that group? Okay. Uh, let me just point out that the citation, it, 
heralds the efforts of VFW District Commander Jamelia Rosa and District Auxiliary President Carla Jane Dunn Watson. Uh, this event will actually take place on, I'm sorry, on May 5th, and Mandy Johanneke will attend the dinner on behalf of the council. Other counselors are also invited to attend. Are there any questions? Yes. So I have a question about proclamations in general. So yes. Arbor Day we do every year. Art Walk is a new, th uh, Art Week is a new thing, but you know, replicating previous. But when it comes to things like the Skating Club of Amherst, just something like the VFW, things that are near and dear to many of our hearts, um, but what's our expectation as to where is the line drawn in terms of how those things work? Now, I appreciate that we were engaged in participating in the dinner and certainly recognizing an anniversary is always very valuable. But before we get too far down this process, I'm just trying to understand if someone will be coming up with some sort of standard as to just so pe I don't want people to feel bad, but I also don't want us to do 25 of these every week. So just trying to understand. Perhaps that. this is something rules of procedure might include. <laughs> Did we take care of that issue? Thank you. Any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to stick to that timeline, gang. Are there any other questions? Uh, so the motion is as follows, and that is to approve the award of the Veterans of Foreign War, Wars VFW citation as presented. Is there a motion? Move. Mandy Jo, a second? I'll second. Dorothy is the second. Any further questions, comments? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Um, we are now going to move on to presentations. And our first one is on the Community Preservation Act. Mr. Bockelman, is there any introduction you want to make to this? Yes. Uh, Anthony Delay Delaney, who is our uh, procurement officer and has been staffing uh, the Community Preservation Act committee uh, this year, has uh, prepared a, a brief presentation on an overview of the CPA how it works, and um, but we know that we're on time constraint, so he'll be extremely efficient, which he always is. Okay. Let me also mention that the reason we're doing this tonight is because later on in the agenda, you will see that we received the recommendation from the CPAC, and we will be referring that to the Finance Committee and the CRC, Community Resources Committee. Anthony. Uh, thank you. My name is Anthony Delaney. I'm the procurement officer for the town and, and one of the staff that's been assisting with the committee. Is the present do I need to call up the presentation? Or? I have a com I have a USB if you need it. <laughs> Sorry? So uh, I will proceed briskly here, and uh, if there are questions at the end, we can circle back on anything you want more information on. Uh, but this is an overview of the CPA process and uh, the committee's role in it. So the Community Preservation Act is Mass General Law Chapter 44B, signed into law in 2000, last amended in 2012, which allows cities and towns that adopt the act to set aside a reserve fund uh, for community preservation purposes. The town adopted it in 2001, levying a 1% surcharge on property taxes above $100,000. Uh, this was last increased in 2015 to 3%, which is the maximum. The act identifies four areas of funding, community housing, historic preservation, open space, and recreation. And each year, 10% of new revenue must be, uh, for CPA must be spent on each of community housing, historic preservation, and open space and recreation combined. So, eligible projects. Uh, there's a, I won't go through the whole chart, but under each category there are various things you, that are and are not acceptable. Um, you can acquire all four 
items under all four categories, but you can't create an historic artifact with CPA funds, somewhat axiomatically. Uh, in addition to the above, CPA funds can be used, uh, can be set aside uh, for later spending, uh, interest payments on borrowing for CPA projects, damages to property owners or, eminent domain, for, or for eminent domain takings, uh, grant matches, property acquisition expenses, and uh, administrative expenses for CPA not to exceed 5% of annual revenues. They may not be spent on replacing operating funds, routine maintenance, gymnasiums, stadiums, or artificial turf fields, or any project without a public purpose or public benefit. The committee has nine members, uh, Conservation Commission, Historical Commission, Planning Board, LSSE Commission, and the Housing Authority each have one person on the board and on the committee, and those five uh, slots are set out in the Mass General Law. And the Town Bylaw also adds four citizens to the committee at large, uh, appointed by the council, and uh, nine is the maximum size of the committee. Mm -hmm. uh, so the CPA process is, uh, this is kind of the ideal process. We were a bit compressed this year, but uh, we had issued the RFP in September uh, with the proposals due back to the committee in, by December. Uh, those proposals are then vetted by uh, committees that specialize in that area. The committee writes questions and submits them to the proposers who answer in writing. In February, the committee starts scheduling presentations over several weeks uh, where they are presented by the proposers and there's a verbal Q&A. These presentations are followed by a public hearing. Then the CPAC votes on what projects they recommend and writes a report. Uh, and then it's sent to the council with the finance committee and then the full council will vote. Uh, the community resources committee, I, I understand, is involved this year. I'm not sure if it's going to be a permanent part of the process or not, but, so they're not reflected. But uh, The council, when they receive the recommendation from CPAC, will find new projects, debt service on old projects, the administrative expenses, and any reserve funding. The council can approve, reduce, or reject any proposal, but may not increase funding or add other projects to the project slate that the CPAC did not approve. Uh, as part of their award, the proposers receive a, a contract, a letter, and any applicable restrictions like historic preservation restrictions or affordable housing restrictions. The proposers or awardees uh, will submit their invoice to the town offices who will review it for compliance and then reimburse the awardees. Uh, when the project is completed, the town closes any remaining balance and returns it to the funding source where it is then available for the next round of CPA funds. So this is uh, just a bar graph of how we've been spending since inception, uh, broken out by area, and lifetime spend in each area. Other there is administrative costs. So uh, in each of the four areas, we've had some notable work. Community housing has the goals of addressing the somewhat skewed housing market in the town. And uh, Olympia Oaks, Rolling Green, Habitat for Humanity have, have been some of the most notable projects in this area. Historic Preservation, Dickinson Plot, the Tiffany Window at the Universal, Unitarian Universalist Church. A uh, number of open space projects, currently about 30% of the town is uh, permanently protected in some way. And the Fort River Farm and the Epstein property were acquired with CPA funds. And. Uh, Recreation, both passive and active spots. So we target them hopefully near population centers, uh, renovating old areas and purchasing new. So uh, if you are looking for further CPA information, uh, the CPA website, Amherst MA, the town's CPA website, amherstma.gov slash CPA, has all of our, has about 10 years of previous projects, timelines, forms, other resources. Uh, the Community Preservation Coalition is an advocacy group and uh, has also a lot of CPA information, legal information and opinions. And uh, the town's master plan, housing production plan, preservation plan, and open space and rec plan also inform the CPA process. So. Are there questions from the council? Alyssa. My question's for the town manager. It is not my belief that the town council will make the uh, at-large appointments. It's my belief the town manager will, but I realize that the bylaw that we passed said select board, so this is one of those. It has to be chosen, and I wondered how, how far we've gotten associated with 
there, there's no automatic assumption that select board means town council. And so I wondered how far we'd gotten with that conversation. So the bylaw hasn't been changed. It's in the bylaw review committee, but I think the, um, the assumption since it's select board would translate into the uh, town manager because the uh, town manager under the town, the new charter appoints all multiple member bodies. Okay, are there additional questions? Yes, Kathy. Um, on one of your slides, you said, said the council, council can approve, reduce, or reject, but not increase. If, if there were an instance that um, a project was questioned in terms of reduce, would you be able to go, CPA be able to go back and find an alternative use for the money in the current year or would become a reserve for the following year or something, something else? So I, I believe it's also in your power to just remand the issue back to the CPA to, to do something with. Um, given the timeline, I'm not sure that we could, that the CPA could make a new recommendation. Make a new recommendation. Uh, I assume it would, if nothing happened to the money, it would just stay in the fund for next year. Mr. Brock. So there isn't a time, there's no deadline for the council to act. So if you decided in the fall uh, that you wanted to, again, do another issuance of CPA funds, if there were funds available, you could do that then. But it's, it's not a once a, once a year, it's, it's a, yeah, okay. That's correct, and it's actually one, something we would like to talk with the Finance Committee about because we want to seg start to structure our whole budget process that CPA is ha handled at a certain time, capital projects, so that the Council and the Finance Committee and staff aren't burdened with everything coming together at the same time. And may I state that that's been noted by the Finance Committee? Okay. Are there other questions on this? Yes, Evan. So that was a really quick overview. Uh, so I, saw, so there, I saw that schedule and I thought. Right. Um, so there are two things that I'd just like to hear a little bit more about um, based on uh, not just this presentation, but also the, the recommendations we have from CPAC. Um, so one is uh, the ability to borrow versus just dispersing funds that are collected, um, how often that's used, when, why. Um, and then also uh, the existence and use of the housing reserve, if you could just speak to those two means of funding. So uh, the bonding is done uh, based, on the, based on the decision of the committee. Um, they decide what projects would make sense and uh, it's usually something that they feel confident or, or strongly about and, and certainly this year that's the case with the one project that they're recommending borrowing. Um, the length, uh, the, whether it's a five or a 10 year borrowing is usually done administratively, but, but whether to borrow is a, is a committee decision um, based on available funds and, and needs and trying to make all the numbers balance. Um, the second question was? The, just an explanation of the housing uh, reserve. Uh, so if the committee does not, has leftover, substantial leftover funds, they might elect to, but not a project to, that they want to fund with them they might decide to reserve the money for, any, for either general use or a specific, a specific use. So this money was set aside previously because there weren't housing projects that they wanted to fund that year, but they wanted to set it aside for a larger or prominent project in the future. So we're expending that this year to address the housing ones. There's a small expected balance that will be a general use for next year under the current plan. Are there additional questions? Let me just point out that the our, the actual action that will be taken is 7E. So if you'd like to ask questions about that at this time, this would be, that would be fine as well. And that actually lays out the projects. But as I understand it, since I was liaison to the committee, there's also a written report that describes these projects. Uh, there is a written report. It is nearly done uh, based on internal conversations. We expect to have it for the subcommittees uh, before the resource committee meets on Wednesday, so, so tomorrow. But the report is not quite ready for prime time tonight. Okay, thank you. But we will be receiving it, and when we do, it'll be distributed not only to those committees, but to all counselors. Yes. Okay. Yes, Mandy Joe. If 
we can ask about the specific proposal, I'm going to go do that <laughs> now. Um, you mentioned the borrowing. I wasn't clear in the one sheet you we got related to the CPA recommendations that it would, that project, that Valley CDC project was actually being recommended because that line item was actually blank on the recommended side, even though underneath it said recommended for borrowing. So one of my questions is, can you clear up whether it is being recommended um, or not? Um, and then um, the spreadsheet that we were given did not actually look like the historic preservation amount met state requirements of a minimum of 10%. So can you address that too? So uh, the Valley CDC project is recommended uh, and they took two votes. They voted to recommend it and then they voted to recommend to borrow for it. Uh, and that's the reason there's no amount on the sheet is it's current year expenditures and the borrowing, will, we will not start paying on the borrowing until next year. So that's why it's a zero. Uh, that 10%, um, I'm not, it's dividing by the wrong thing, and I'm not entirely sure why the spreadsheet is set up that way, but the 10% is only on new revenues, and our new revenue number is, I believe, 106,000, so, uh, or 10% of our new revenue right there now is, I think, 106,000, and we're spending about 150,000 on historic preservation. So it's not, temper we are not meeting 10% of the whole expenditure, but we are meeting it based on new revenue, which is what the statute requires. Are there additional questions? Shalini. Could you tell us a little bit about the process of uh, how these uh, projects are selected? And I also just wanted to understand in the eligible projects what the word support means. And for example, community housing is yes, but the others are no. So again, just a little bit what that means. Uh, so the projects are first vetted for basic eligibility. Uh, does it meet the historic, de the statute definition of a historic artifact or uh, is it, or uh, for the open, uh, they're vetted by the committee for basically statutory compliance and uh, that's kind of the first round and um, then basically the committee asks the questions to determine, to they start to form opinions based on how valuable the project is, how much of it is going to benefit the public, uh, return on investment, whether the in some cases, whether the project is going to have a permanent affordable restriction or uh, might only be a short-term benefit. So there's a, there's a number of uh, factors and those are kind of worked out in the quite Q&A and the presentations and kind of over a long period of time. And uh, then in the end, it's, uh, well, they, the committee has done different things every year. This year they took a straw poll to kind of weigh them uh, and then they would kind of work their way down the list based on their relative weight of uh, what, what made the cut and didn't. Um, I might have someone else to weigh in on support because my understanding is that there's a very long discussion about what is and isn't support. Mr. Bachman. I'm, I'm going to weigh in on something prior to that. Yeah. So there's a general call for projects early at the beginning of the process. So and it's been published and anybody can submit a proposal. And there are lots of proposals that are submitted. Some are withdrawn after they have additional conversations to see if it meets the cri basic criteria of falling under um, this, the, the uh, requirements of the state law for this support. I don't know if I have a good answer for support. I, I can get you some of that literature later. I don't have it at my fingertips, but there is a long discussion about what is qualified support for, for community housing. Okay. Yes, Mandy Joe. Um, when we get the report from the CPA, will it also discuss why certain projects were not recommended or will we only see the recommended side and all? Oh. Yeah, the committee this year decided to add rejected projects and a brief explanation of why. Uh, it will not include any withdrawn projects that were withdrawn before the vote, but it will include affirmatively rejected projects. Thank you. Are there additional questions? I, I am just Evan. curious. I have a question, but it's more for, I guess, you, actually, which is okay. when, when we eventually take these up, is it the intention that we take them up 
as a package of recommendations or would we be voting on each of these individually? So the process after tonight is that this will be referred both to the finance committee to look at the financial side of things and to the CRC community resources committee because so many of these areas really fall under the charge for the community resources committee and it's while they're just beginning their process of organization, it's an opportunity for them to at least look at it this year. Both of those committees will come back to the council with recommendations, and the council will then take it up and make decisions. We do not need to accept carte blanche. We can do individuals as Anthony has described to us. Yes, Kathy. Okay, um, I, I, it's a follow-up question on, on Evans. Um, I have a series of questions about some of the criteria that was used and the distribution that I see here. Um, would it, what I was thinking is I might write them up and get them out in advance so when this comes to finance, people will have thought about them. Because right. they're more global rather than about a specific project, but an example would be a criteria for land acquisition and when we, ta when we buy it as public, it takes it out of the tax base. Do we worry about that? So I have some generic mm -hmm. questions, recreational fields, what gets in, what gets out, can I see what's gotten in? So I thought I'd type them up and share them with both committees so that... I think that would be okay. perfectly fine. And then as we come back for the full council to look at it, we can also look at the responses. Are there additional questions at this time? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Moving on with our agenda, the next item is the recommend, recommendation on request for use of public ways. And we're trying something a little new tonight uh, in that um, I've taken the liberty of the reports that were sent to us in advance and developed slides so that the public can see in summary what we're talking about with each of the reports. And uh, Mandy Jo, I'm going to turn this over to you for the presentation. Thank you. So the council had referred the town manager's recommendation on how to handle public ways to governance and governance over the course of three meetings discussed that recommendation and its own sort of thoughts on public ways, spoke with um, a former select board member, Connie Kruger, about her thoughts um, on handling of public ways and also then forwarded a draft proposal to the town manager um, seeking comment from him. He had referred that and sought comment on his own from many different people that would be involved in this. So it has been through and received before coming back to the council a number of sort of thoughts and reviews. Um, in the end, the Governance Committee generally adopted what the town manager had requested in his initial report to the council on who would handle which ones, um, which requests, but we also added a full section, which is the town commons, which is the one right up here that is shown right now, um, that the select board had not generally handled event requests on the common, and the GOL committee believed that we should um, sort of formalize what gets handled by the council and what gets handled by the town manager or the town manager's designee on those issues because the commons are technically in the public way. Um, so for the town commons, as you can see up here, short-term event requests um, like the Taste of Amherst, um, the Sustainability Festival, that the common portion of those requests would go to the, <clears throat> excuse me, go to the town manager. Um, less than three months of use, specific events. Um, the ones that would stay with the council are long-term event uses. We couldn't really, as a, as a committee, actually come up with something that might fall under that category, just so you know. Because um, even many of the holiday structures that go up are fall under the three-month timeline. But we figured we had short-term and we had permanent and we were missing a category. Um, so for now, that one stays with the town council to be comprehensive, um, long-term uses associated with specific events. And then the third category is pretty much everything else that is meant to be sort of permanent. Um, that would include what the, uh, I think it's the bid is looking at and had some 
contests out for a band structure. That approval would come back to the council if that ever moves forward. Um, paving of, of sidewalks within the common if they wanted to redesign that, that north common that's sort of on hold right now, all of that would come back to the council for things. The third category does exempt maintenance and repairs at the request of the manager and it made sense to govern governance committee to exempt um, maintenance of benches on the common and stuff like that, that they could just do that um, with the town manager's sort of approval. Um, the, the governance, you'll see in all of this that all requests that go to the town manager and the town manager has authority that we're we would delegate to the town manager, he has to report back on everything on that. Um, we know that is over, it's actually more than the town manager had recommended and you'll see that throughout, but we as governance thought this is a new thing for the council to be delegating. We should know exactly what's coming. We can always look at this policy later um, to see whether we want reports on everything or not going forward, but to start with it all and then you can always go less from there. So that's the commons. Um, if we can go to the next slide, we'll see the parking. Thank you, Margaret. <laughs> the parking is, um, was the one that we had the hardest decision and most discussion about in a committee, um, in the committee. We ended up going with the town manager's recommendation with a change, which is all short-term requests would have a report and the manager had recommended that those that only had I think one to three parking spaces for less than 14 days would not be reported to the council and we combined that with his other one um, so that all short-term requests um, cumulative or consecutive up to 14 days um, would be delegated to him. Um, Long-term requests we added that category in separated it out from permanent we as council the governance recommends the council keep those requests um, and permanent, again, any type of permanent parking changes the governance committee is recommending the council keep. The discussion on this one, as I said, it was the one that we had the hardest time on. We, we were split on the committee um, as to whether we should make the delineation based on length of time for the request, so the days, or whether the split should be based on number of spots because there's a recognition in governance that a large number of spots, say the entire North Main Street parking area, requested for one day can have a substantial impact on parking in town. Um, that type of request would, under this recommendation, go to the town manager um, and would not come to the council. And But yet a request that was for one spot um, say on a street to hold a dumpster for 15 days would come to the council. That one has a much smaller impact on parking in town, yet it would come to the council. So we, we had a large discussion as to how you could split it based on impacts and we couldn't really come up with it. Um, and in the end, the majority of the governance committee said go with this day split instead of the number of spaces split. There was one um, member, uh, Councillor Evan, um, who wanted more of a number of spots split instead of a number of days. Um, so, I, And when I'm done, he can speak to that more if, if he would like. Um, so that's parking. Uh, the next one is roads and sidewalks. And temporary closures, the governance committee recommends that it be left with the department head most in charge of that closure. So fire department, police department, DPW, for things like maintenance or safety. Um, Short-term closures um, that aren't the safety and maintenance and all of that um, for planned events would fall to the town manager. Um, again, a 14-day split. Long-term closures would come to the town council and permanent or other requests related to sidewalks or roads would come to the town council as the recommendation of the governance committee. Um, during, and I'm just gonna say one more thing, that pretty much covers everything in this recommendation that we are forwarding on to the council. We um, came in during the discussions with this it was mentioned that the select board didn't fully, potentially didn't fully complete the, um, the 
food truck bylaw. Um, that there is one, but it might not have been fully studied and fully implemented or fully written, and there was a recommendation to maybe go back to that. That does not fall under governance, so governance will not be taking that up. Um, governance also said because of this impact issue and to give guidance to not only the council when dis dis deciding public way requests, but to give guidance to the town manager for those that we would be potentially delegating to the town manager, that maybe the council should work on coming up with a guideline for reviewing public way requests and determining whether or not they should be granted with some sort of guidelines that relates to impacts or something like that. Again, GOL did not believe that felt with, fell within GOL's charge. Um, but we also did not feel like we had the right to tell another committee or bring it to the council to tell another committee to do that. So my recommendation on things like that, and again, a fee structure, um, things like that, is that maybe there's a committee out there that might want to take some of that up. My report talks about that. Um, and so I'm just going to mention that. And if there's, a, I'm going to give Evan a chance to talk more about parking if he so wishes, and then we'll take questions. I don't think I need to speak to this. I think if you're uh, interested in uh, where my position lay, uh, you can read it in our report. Um, but I don't necessarily see a reason to relitigate that issue. Are there are there other members of the committee who would like to speak to the report? Okay. Are there questions? Yes, Dorothy. Um, <clears throat> when I read this, I thought, oh, it says all non-banner events. And it crossed my mind, not for the first time, who decides what are the banner events? Mr. Bachman. I'll address that. Okay. that it was probably not worded well. Um, banner requests are the, you know, the banner that goes across. Right. So the banner request is just that banner. Um, the policy recommendation is not to make the town manager report on every request that comes forward to put a banner across the street. So um, that is a public way request for roads and sidewalks. Um, and so we exempted that out in a very not so word friendly way apparently when I reread it. But that so any request that doesn't relate to flying posting that banner. But would the question be I think is who does approve banners? That's the, question. the town manager would. Okay. But that was not as part of this public way discussion. That's kind of important. Mr. Bachman? I'm not sure if I understand the question. Was it, was this a, was, was there a recommendation in your original memo about banner uh, permission? No. Okay. Alyssa. There was nothing about banner in his original thing, just as there was nothing about the common in his original thing, because he inherited a system under which Previous select boards prior to my service had delegated the common and the banners to the town manager, which is why I specifically asked that GO, when GOL look at this, that they include common. I think that they we might have a, an additional discussion about banner as to why we are choosing to delegate that or not. I think there could potentially be additional discussion on that. But those are things that, as I said, historically, were, and so they weren't in his recommendation to us because they historically had just been ceded over to the town manager many years ago. Let me just take this opportunity to mention, we are not voting tonight. We may choose to refer for additional discussion of GOL or to some other committee, but we are not voting to accept this tonight. Dorothy. Um, I would really like to have a, a, I'm sure, I don't know when the planning is done, but I'm sure it is, because there's just so many weeks in the year and there seems to be banners up a lot in the nice weather. I would love to have a list of banner events with the dates, just so I have some idea of what's coming. I'm always surprised. And I say, oh, it's this, why is it not that? And you know, I'm not saying that, that I don't like what is a banner event. I'm just saying I'd like to know what they are ahead of time, if I could. Okay. Kathy. Um, I, I have a, just a question. By setting up this grid, am I right in interpreting it that for the short terms that we, at several meetings, have spent time saying, are we 
okay with four parking spaces or two, those won't come to us anymore? Correct, if we would approve this policy. Okay. Let me just note that there is a, it should be A, B, and C, not A, A, B. Okay. Yes. But to clarify, we would receive in a report, we would know, we would know about them, we just wouldn't approve them. Yeah, I, I just meant it, it, it facilitates our agendas if we don't have to discuss, discuss okay. one space, two space, four space, yes. Right. Are there additional questions, comments? Yes, Pat. In term, and this is probably a question for Paul. Um, in terms of our being responsible for the public ways, we are then, are we also then responsible for speed limits, et cetera? Seems like we would be. Yes, you are. Yes, we are. Are there other questions or comments on this? Going forward, um, I'm sorry. I, I was listen. waiting to see if anybody else had anything. Lunch carts, um, I would indicate that we did in fact finish everything we needed to finish ex as a select board, except we were waiting for staff. We were waiting for staff to delineate for us back when we had a number of approved lunch carts, which I know other people call food trucks because that's what they look like, but they're technically called lunch carts in our regulation, is that we said they could be in certain parts of town, and then we realized, ooh, what if two wanted to be next to each other because you can't use up the whole sidewalk, right? You could say one of you could fit, or the other of you could fit, or maybe two little ones could fit, and that was going to just have to be something that was worked out, and then it just kind of fell lower on the list because Nobody really wants to be having a lunch cart right now other than the one that's in front of you. you. So that's kind of on the hold list of, to be dealt with because that is the public way, but we also need Rob Mora and his staff to tell us what's the right fit for these things so you're not obstructing paths of wheelchairs and you know next to crosswalks and that sort of thing, curb cuts and everything. So um, the overall regulation was done, but should be looked at again next time somebody wants to apply for one. But in terms of where we could put it was getting confusing because we had limited to very specific places in town and we weren't sure where the color forms fit on the map as to how many people could be in each of those. The other thing I just wanted to ask about is that we go ahead and I'm, I'm glad we may have additional conversation at a different level associated with some of these issues. One thing I would like to just add somehow, and I'm not sure quite how to put this into the wording and, and ask that GOL consider that or whoever this is referred to, is that one of the things that has happened in the past, again, that this town manager inherited, is that when contractors are working on long-term projects, they do not, generally speaking, always work effectively with staff as to, so they're not feeding meters, they're just parking for hours down at, wrong direction, at Kendrick Park, for example, when one East Pleasant Street was being done. And so nobody was paying for those meters. Those meters weren't bagged. Those meters hadn't been reserved. The contractors just parked there. And so that, I would like it to somehow be covered that if we're ceding all this to the town manager, that in fact, there will also be some method of follow-up where whoever parking enforcement belongs to right now reports back to the town manager and says, you know, there are all these trucks parked there, these contractors, we should work out something, right? Whether it's bagging those meters or working out a fee for a particularly long time, because these tend to be long-term sorts of things. This has happened many years in the past, well prior to one East Pleasant Street, where you would go into the banks yeah and there'd be trucks everywhere, and nobody was paying for anything, so. Okay, so let me suggest the following. We have before us a report and a recommendation, which we are not going to vote on tonight, that, but we will bring back up, and it, I would suggest that we would probably want to go, and at least in a future meeting, maybe even as early as May 6th, go ahead and vote on this portion of this. And then there are other issues that have been raised. One is around construction related to, I mean, parking related to construction. Another is the one about uh, food trucks. And the third one is around banners. And uh, it does seem that all of those are related to public ways. And the question really is whether or not um, that should go back to GOL or it should go back to GOL and also with advice from CRC.
I'm sorry, Sean. And just the, I mean, the speed limits question as well, it, and no? Let's not deal with, not I think speed limits has to be dealt with separate separately. than this. And what about the rates? Yes. R rates and, you know, how much we're charging from who and what the process is for uh, parking? How much are we charging for parking? Yeah. Like, you know, we've been making decisions about different events that are happening, and so the process for the, that. It, I think, also. again, that's a different discussion than this. This is a matter of who's going to grant it, okay? And then those other questions are, what speed limit do we want to set separately and what areas? Another issue is, what should we be charging for and to whom for parking, but not part of this particular effort? This is to be, I, I see this as an opportunity for us to relieve our agenda of some items that, frankly, take a lot of time. Those other issues, I'm sure, will take a lot of time for discussion, too. So this is going to come back at a future meeting, possibly as early as May 6th. If there's anything that GOL wants to amend in terms of wordsmithing or anything else, and then at that point, we will take up the issue of where are we going to refer the other three items? And if possible, we may also at that point say, and we'd like to have an opportunity to come back on speed limit and parking rates. Okay, anything else? Okay, moving on. Um, council liaisons to committees. Um, Alyssa, you are the chair of the Rules of Procedure, and so as I did in the other thing, I've created a slide uh, using the charts that you provided, but you might want to give a preliminary to this. So, there's a lot of material in your packet associated with this. Hopefully you had time to look at it. Our liaison discussion was based largely on A, the charter, because the charter allows us to have non-voting liaisons to various committees, multiple member bodies, and the school committee and the library trustees, which are called out as a reminder to everyone because they're not identified as multiple member bodies in the charter, although by law they are considered multiple member bodies in terms of things like open meeting law and ethics. But the way our charter treats them, they are treated somewhat differently. Nonetheless, we could assign, self-assign non-voting liaisons to those committees. So we looked back at what the select board was doing in terms of, again, select board was an elected body that was sending non-voting liaisons to some committees. If you looked at old select board agendas, you would see on the reverse of that all of our assignments and we would sometimes report out on those during meetings. So what you see there is actually a list of priorities, but what I wanted to speak of first is what is the purpose of liaisons? And so that's on, your actual report from the committee on the letterhead that we talked about this in general at a previous council meeting on the first and then we added in a draft rule that will appear in the rules document that you will be getting in just a matter of weeks as it comes down to it and talks about what liaisons do and so that's what we talked about in terms of what the role is and then we got rather specific if you move on to, if you can scan down to the next part of that which is associated with its items A through J on the report. It's the next sure slide. Where we are slides. It's, there's two slides. We did not rehearse the slides thing at all. I'm just really pleased that we have them, so thank you for making them. Um, so, liaisons, I'm not going to read all this to you, but basically what the deal is, let me just make it simple. Liaisons are not members of the bodies that they go to. Liaisons are there to be a link between that body and the work of the council. We all are terribly curious about what all these different bodies do. We all have limited time, and we also need to not insert ourselves in the middle of their work. But we were looking at priorities in terms of bodies that are likely to bring us things. So if they're likely to bring us something to work on, then it seems wise to have at least been become aware of what they are doing prior to them doing that. So it's not a big surprise to everyone when they come to us. We talked to in here specifically, of course, liaisons can't commit the council to a course of action. Not all bodies would have liaisons. 
Um, we said, and we even debated for a moment whether or not people should be allowed to request them for their committee, but we wanted to give people that option. We might very well have to say no because we don't have enough time. Um, we have to talk a little bit later about a method of drawing straws. If more than one person wants to serve as a liaison, because of course each body would only have one, we would inform people annually on all these different bodies who their liaisons were. We would have the president write them a note that says, by the way, these are the liaisons assigned. We're sorry for the other committees, but we don't have time to go to all of those. The other thing that we didn't really get into in terms of workload is that you may be terribly interested in what a particular body is doing as a town councilor and as somebody who might be serving on a council committee that feels like it's related to the work of the other committee. But if they meet at a certain time that you teach a class, well, you're not going to get to go. And so that doesn't mean you couldn't be their liaison, in theory, because you don't have to go to all their meetings, but you would need to keep in touch with them otherwise. You would need to get their agendas, get their minutes, talk to their chair offline, for example. So you have to take into account not only what is interesting to you, but also what actually fits in your schedule, because they're not going to change their schedule to accommodate you. In terms of the priorities of the committees, which we could go back to that slide, because I know we're racing here because we want to we want to get a lot done tonight, is these are the item, these are the groups that seemed most likely to be some group that we'd be interacting with at some point in the near to short term future. And so given all the choices of workload, et cetera, this seemed like Crop one. This does not mean some committees are better than others. It's nothing like that. It's simply who we think we might need more interaction with at this point. And some of these things are in flux, like downtown parking working group we thought was going to be done a year ago is still now working with a liaise, is working with a consultant, and will eventually, in theory, be absorbed into transportation advisory. But in the meantime, downtown parking working group is going to be sending us some recommendations. So there's actually, and we've also seen an email from Downtown Parking Working Group that asks us to have a member. So some things are not quite as clean as others because we have short-term needs that are coming up. Other things are things that we just simply want to be aware of. So Community Preservation Act Committee, a number of people on rules brought that up as being something, hey, we just talked about community preservation earlier tonight, and that that's going, that's going to be a big focal point for a number of people. School committee issues, redevelopment authority issues. There was some concern expressed about elected bodies versus appointed bodies. So I think everybody needs to think about their comfort level associated with that because if people are elected on a ballot, um, that doesn't mean we can't talk to them, but it was something that we specifically held back on as a select board when we were in executive branch, but it is in fact called out in the charter that there could be a non-voting liaison to elected bodies like the library trustees and the school committee. So I think we just have to decide as a group where our comfort level lies. Then there are additional sections to the spreadsheet, and the spreadsheet is in fact available to you. Just play with as a spreadsheet, not just as a PDF of the spreadsheet, so that you can sort it by all these different columns. Because when I first showed this report to rules, they said, really, why do we have all these columns? There's so much stuff here. But that's so that you could play with it a bunch of different ways whether or not they have liaisons, um, who they're appointed by now, who they were appointed by in the past. And then there's actually a whole section in the spreadsheet that isn't shown here because we don't need it tonight of what our current assignments are in terms of our committees. So for people to be thinking about their workloads and things that might be finishing up and things that, might, that you might be wanting to transfer to. Right. Are there other comments from the committee? Kathy? Yeah, I just, this is a good slide to point this out. There are a few of these. So the very first one listed affordable housing trust. It has had a trustee that was a select board member, and I believe bylaws is looking at whether it would have a council member as a trustee. So in, in these instances, it says liaison or possible member because we weren't sure where this would come out, you know, that, that there was a direct link as a voting member. So if if you were on as a trustee, you wouldn't be a liaison. You would be a voting member of the group. The other one on this list is the parking group. It has a voting member, and they actually wrote us a note that they often have trouble getting a quorum because the select board member who was on it went off, so they're down a number. So a few of these are interactive with, is there going to be a council member on them? And then 
if the answer was yes, presumably we wouldn't also have a liaison. So it's, there's, there's an interaction on a few of these, not very many. And this group has two. There are a few on the second tier. Okay. Are there additional comments from the committee? I've heard um, a couple of council members who have attended meetings, uh, not necessarily as official liaisons, but out of their own interest in the area. And it would be useful for me and the rest of us to hear their perspective on how that has been received and their interactions at those meetings. George? <laughs> well, I would fit that description. I'm sure others would as well. Um, I have, out of interest, and the district that I serve, I have been attending the uh, what's called the CCC. It's at the very bottom of this uh, long list, but it's essentially the uh, Campus and Community Coalition to Prevent Underage Drinking. Um, my experience, uh, it's a very impressive body. Um, I've been well received. We've had, actually in the past, we've had um, members of the select board as uh, active members of that committee. Um, so that's a case where we might have to discuss if this were to continue. Um, one of the reasons I believe actually for that is that at that time the select board was responsible for the issues of licenses. And um, so it was appropriate for at least one, or it was actually two I believe, who served on the CCC because of their role as, um, as, as the, basically the board of licenses. Now that that is a duty that is not uh, our responsibility, um, uh, they've actually expressed an interest in approaching the uh, Board of Licenses and asking if someone of them would like to come. But my experience has been very positive. I find it extremely helpful and enlightening, um, and I've been well received by uh, the people there. I make it very clear, I don't speak much, um, but when I do speak, I make it clear that I'm mostly asking questions, but I don't speak for the council. So okay. that's one example. Additional questions or comments? Observations of your experience? Yes, Kathy. Um, I've gone to a couple different ones. Um, actually, George was at one I went to with the Transportation Advisory Committee. Mm -hmm. And I would second how useful it is, because in, in that case, um, the particular day had an agenda that was very rich with priority setting and a better understanding on how that committee might interact with the Joint Capital Committee in terms of projects that would be coming and they're trying to think of their recommendations. So getting an early view of that I think would be useful for the council as they make decisions. So that was one and then this, um, when we put planning board up there, we put the planning board zoning subcommittee and Steve will know a lot about this, but it's been meeting quite some time and started last summer and they are looking at potential amendments to the zoning law that they will bring to the council. So you get a chance to see an emerging document. And in both instances, they were very welcome just having a member of the public to just sit there and take documents away and listen. Um, so again, it, it was a very early window into, in the second case, something they were saying six months or later, once the council sits, these would come forward. But that sense of early warning um, and information, I thought was very useful. Other observations? I, I will, yes, Pat. Um, I, <clears throat> I've gone to several different kinds of meetings. I've gone, per, but I'm particularly going to talk about the Housing Trust and the Affordable Housing Coalition because on the Housing Trust meetings, I'm there as an observer. I'm, um, I'm taking notes for myself. I'm not speaking for the council. On the coalition, um, those of us who have gone to those meetings are much more actively engaged in the conversation. Um, we're not speaking for the council. Um, we have certainly been well received and we've been, uh, Evan and I particularly have been investigating different things that have come up in the coalition to see how we could support different uh, things. Um, so I, I I understand uh, the importance of a li liaison being um, a neutral party, really. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but uh, that will be, I like the engagement that we can have when we can have it, where, where it's clearly defined and acceptable. I 
will relate my own experience. I've been liaison to CPAC. Um, they did get to their point of their final report recently, and they were going to not share with us the um, people that had applied and whose applications had been forwarded, but they decided not to fund. And I said, you know, I actually have to say, I think it would be useful for the council to have all of that information, and they, thus they are including that. Thank you, Anthony. <laughs> Um, I also had an experience as chairing of DPW Fire Station um, Committee um, where Andy Steinberg was liaison to us. Now this is during the period of our government where we had town meeting and his one of his major roles was to make sure that he could help us meet all the guidelines and the steps to get to the point where we would meet the deadline for town meeting. Some of that has changed, but um, we still have a whole process by which something then comes to the council. And so that would be part of what a liaison might help with without kind of taking it on themselves, if you will. And of course, checking with the president of the council and the town manager. So those, and, and Andy was very useful in that regard, extremely useful. Uh, and frankly, especially as we came down to looking at the zero energy rewrite of the bylaw and so forth. So um, those have been my experiences. I personally am going to say until we have an opportunity for bylaws and so forth to look at possible members on these committees, I'd prefer that we stay to liaisons, but that is a personal opinion. It's not telling you what you should do. Pat, did you have something? Okay. So, yes, Mandy Jo. Um, I, I'm on rules committee, so this came out of a committee I serve on, um, but I wanna, before, I, I understand we'll be voting on this at some point soon, so I wanna mm -hmm. put out there that at that committee, I'm still not confident that this is the right group, whether two is the group, you know, there's there's so many choices to make that I'd like the council to really think about what they might want in terms of committees and all. But I wanna also put out there that between the ones and twos, there's 19 committees on that list. Even the ones are eight committees um, and my biggest concern with any of this is time. And I know we don't, if we're liaisoning, don't have to go to meetings. Um, but I also know that going to the meetings is what helps you figure out what they're actually talking about and what's coming back. Reading an agenda is not as helpful and reading minutes is not as helpful. Um, Speaking as a former charter commissioner, the goal of the council was not to have the councillors have full-time jobs or even heavily part-time jobs as councillors. And I just wanna put this right up there of the more we put on liaisons and add to our workload, the harder it is in the future to have a good representative body of our town. So I think we should really consider whether liaisons are what we need or want, um, and which bodies, if we do want them, are absolutely necessary versus potentially not. Um. Dorothy. Well, my thought about liaisons, I, as I look at my calendar and I write down four or five meetings on a day that I would like to get to, is that it's it's not possible. So, what, But I have thought in terms of the Community Resources Committee, that we should, amongst the members, have a discussion of some informal liaisons who to try to cover some of the key committees, because there's so many committees that relate to the CRC. Um, and that way, uh, so instead of it being me just kind of putting down, or individuals putting down thoughts and preferences, but um, within committees, if they had uh, coverage of some of the key committees through the committee members, that might help out a lot. Steve. Yeah, so I was looking through this list, and I'm now looking through the CRC community resources lens, and virtually all of them are 
you know, directly related to the mission of the CRC, but nor do I think that, so we know that the CRC was, is now five people, 10, 10 of us volunteered for that. So for coronation purposes, it would make sense that some of these, like the planning board, be a CRC member, but on the other hand, I can make the exact opposite argument to spread the wealth and to not you know, sort of consolidate you know, power and knowledge into one group. Um, I, I have a, while I have the mic, I have a structural question. So the one that doesn't fit for me actually is the planning board one. So I always thought that the select board was a liaison. There was a select board of liaison to the planning board, I thought. Okay, because the zoning subcommittee as a construct is created by the planning board. It's the, and so they created it with a liaison for, or we, well, we, they, whomever, <laughs> created the zoning subcommittee and they said we, there shall be a select board liaison? Because that was a construct of, this, of the planning board itself. If, if we don't have a definite answer, yeah. we'll just leave that for the moment. Yeah. Okay. I did have a follow-up on that. So to be clear in my understanding, which former planning board chair may have a different understanding of, um, zoning subcommittee hasn't just been meeting since last summer. They've been meeting for years. We've had a zoning subcommittee of the planning board for many years. And they are currently looking at changing some bylaws, but that's always been their focus point. And so they just now have the added impetus of doing it because the form of government's changed and whatever other things are on their plate. But the zoning subcommittee has been meeting for ever. One of the reasons the select board was sending a liaison to the zoning subcommittee was much as what Lynn mentioned earlier in terms of DPW fire stations. So not everybody who's on planning board was a member of town meeting, wasn't particularly familiar with some of the town meeting things. And so it was a good conduit of information to make sure everybody was on the same page. Plus the select board was going to be making a recommendation on planning board work. The reason we didn't actually send a liaison to the planning board was because that seemed politically fraught. And so that's why we didn't do it. So we went to the zoning subcommittee because that was more about the bylaws rather than permits they might be working on or something like that. On a different topic, um, ex in terms of expressing interest on these, and that was an interesting idea about the CRC too, and with the caveat that you mentioned that you know maybe if you couldn't get on the CRC, but then you wanted to be a liaison to a committee that was important to the CRC, then that could all work together very nicely. Um, I know we aren't planning to decide this tonight. I think it's important that we get feedback on the rule associated with it because that's something we're gonna be bringing back to you. We might as well deal with it now if you have questions about it. But it does, but we did talk tonight a little bit about expressing interest and also I think Mandy Joe phrased it very well and I wanted to follow up on that. I don't think we're in a position of requiring anyone to do anything. I think it would be a little weird if we sent somebody off to be the liaison to the sister city committees and didn't have anybody liaisoning to any of the housing groups. Like that would be a little strange um, to officially do that rather than just people showing up because they felt like it. Um, because we should have priorities. But I'm not sure we're yet at the point in terms of workload, given all our intense committee work, that we're ready to say, these six groups have to have a liaison, somebody has to do it. Like, th that feels uneasy to me. Are there other comments? Kathy. The only comment I would have is, I think some of us have direct interest in a few of these, so if you were thinking at the next council meeting, if you find out whether people had strong preferences, either on a grid where we just sent them in or not, you know, or, or are we just going to, I mean, because there are a few I'm just going to keep going to, but I'm not a, officially anything other than a resident of Amherst right now. Let me suggest that first of all, I don't see us sitting here at a council meeting saying, who wants to do this? <laughs> not going to happen. Uh, so I'm hearing a couple things. I'm hearing, first of all, that maybe we need to go back and look at one and two, probably not three, that it would be useful to have some sense of where the council feels it is most appropriate to have liaisons and where maybe it's not as appropriate for whatever reason, either it's not as high a priority or it's a politically charged situation or it's an elected body and we're not elected or whatever the reason might be. 
Okay. And then finally, it would be interesting to know, even if we aren't going to do any appointments of counselors as liaisons at the time being, to be, at least understand people's interests. And I would do as I've done in the past, and that would be done with a poll that I send out to you and you send back to me, only to me, and I then present the results of that publicly so that it's never it's with full transparency. Um, meantime, however, I've also heard the suggestion that CRC might need to look at this list, especially with that idea of those questions that I just asked, which are most important, and so forth. Again, we're not voting on this tonight. So I would suggest it go it look at CRC. However, I do want to go back to the slide, Margaret, that you just had up there. Not that one, the, the um, one, that list right there. This is really the proposed rules of procedure uh, for what liaisons are. And so at least I would like to make sure when we come back on May 6th that we look at this and decide if there's any changes that we would like to make. So that at least we keep moving this along. Now, suggestions? Yes. So in regards to that polling, one of the things that we try to differentiate at rules is that this would not be president appointments, but we really appreciate that she'd be willing to coordinate them. Um, we did do the horse trading when it was a five member select board. Don't think we should try it for 13. Don't think that was a good, it would be a great idea. But that was one of the reasons that the spreadsheet in spreadsheet form has spaces so you could, you know, at least sort of line yourself up before you answer the poll as to where you think you fit most appropriately. I think in terms of where rules is at, in terms of us having a draft ready, I'm not sure that we need to look at this separately. We, it's going to be in the rules. It's gonna be in the rules that you're gonna get pretty, pretty darn soon, actually. Mm -hmm. So if you have particular feedback about this, we should go ahead and either hear it tonight or get it to me and we will discuss it as a group because we're meeting every week to try and meet our deadline to get things to you so that we meet our deadline of six months. Um, but at this point, unless there's something egregious that you see here, that you see that we need to be wordsmith, yeah, obviously you will see it again as part of the larger document. But I'm thinking we don't need to revisit this list outside of the larger rules document. Thank you. And so I will amend that. We will see this list again if you have any feedback individually only to Alyssa's chair. But we will see this again when rules comes forward. And at that point, we'll move through the adoption process. Um, I want to say that um, there may be an official liaison, but that other council members can attend any committee that they want to. So to me, the chief thing that makes a liaison is that they must receive all the official papers, documents, and notifications of the committee. But beyond that, the difference between them and a council member attending the committee, I don't think is that much different. Um, just there is one, there's only, sorry, I, the, to the extent there's something to report back, mm -hmm. there is an obligation if there would be some, you know, early alerts is the only difference. Um, if we were just casually doing, we wouldn't be doing it as much as the way we've written this. Okay. George. If people are attending, as Dorothy suggested, um, some of these meetings. Is it of use for counselors to know this? Um, is that something that would be useful if somebody's constantly going to say TAC, or in my case, to CCC or whatever, uh, apart from whoever gets established as official liaisons, whatever, but is that something the council would really like to know or are we just gonna leave it, maybe it's appropriate just to leave it informal, but um, if you know that someone is regularly doing this or is sort of the, the person who goes regularly, you could always reach out to them if you have questions. So is that something? So maybe the information I collect is threefold. What committees have you been attending? Uh, which committees do you feel should have liaisons? And which committees are you personally interested in? Okay. And again, not presidential decision to be brought forward to the council for your decision making. Anything else? Okay, then I'm going to suggest we move on. We have now gone over our time frame, and I'm the next person up, so here you go. Uh, 
These are, let me just give you the history on this, Town Coles. Uh, we began this conversation at our retreat, which was an open meeting. It was on February 2nd. Uh, since then, we formed the ad hoc committee on goals. Uh, and that group has now met four times. And what we have before you is, at this point, our recommended set of town goals, town council goals. These are ongoing, year one, and then year one and beyond. We are not voting on these tonight. We would certainly like your feedback. Some of you have already, because I sent this out to you, asked specific questions. For example, where does town manager evaluation fall? Well, it falls under Amherst Town Government. And other ones that you've asked about, I believe, are things like public way. And again, it falls under one of these others. So the second thing you received in your packet is a overly ambitious <laughs> uh, work plan. <laughs> so if we can just look at that for just a moment, and let me just say, this comes from my years of writing proposals, so just accept that flaw. Uh, and it basically, each of these goals is now being referred, if you will, to one of the committees. And that committee will then fill in the work plan as they see fit and will provide you with some information about how we'd like you to do that. And then uh, you'll come back to the council with that. We'd like to go ahead and approve the goals, not tonight, but at a very future town meeting, I mean town council meeting. And that would be uh, useful, but it would be also best if you look at the draft worksheet, our work plan before you even do that. Are there any questions at this point? Nothing, please note that on the worksheet, it says suggested activities. And on a number of occasions, it says, et cetera, which means we know it wasn't complete. Okay, yes, Alyssa. I, I really appreciate the worksheet and that be, because those, the, ugh, that's wicked squishy. I have no use for that. Mm -hmm. Establish a new form of government. Yay, we did that. No, we didn't do that. What does that even mean? Right. So that's why I think your worksheet is really well laid out in terms of considering what the activities would be, the timeline, who's responsible, how will we know when we did it, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. kind of thing. And so I appreciate that you start there and turns into that. But I would actually, I don't want to vote on that. I don't, I don't like okay. that but I, I'd be much more comfortable with the way the worksheet, that, that's the way my brain works in terms of actually evaluating okay. our progress. I will say that in anticipation of the worksheet, CRC is already taking this up on Wednesday. And they have several things on the worksheet, by the way. Yes, George. And the hope is that the uh, other committees would do likewise? That yes. That they would take the worksheet? Yes. So OCA, GOL, right. Where else? Am I Finance. Finance. Um, uh, ad hoc rules. Right. We, um, where they appear in the worksheet, they would take on, a look. And right. Look. Again, I think it's behooving on our committee to send a set of, rec of uh, instructions, if you will, about what each committee should do, and a sense of the time frame. Mandy Joe. So I liked the worksheet. I had some questions when I went through the worksheet um, about things that might be missing. Um, I know GOL isn't really a part of a bylaw review for zoning, but GOL will, would get under the charges those, and so that was one set where it wasn't even mentioned in the goals that I think we should at least be mentioned, since it would have to come to us prior as, as the last sort of site. Um, in the comprehensive capital plan, JCPC seemed missing um, from that discussion completely. And we can't really leave the library trustees and the school committee out of a 10-year comprehensive capital plan. Um, and also, I would recommend putting JCPC in there somewhere. Um, the FY21 budget guidelines, which was a, I don't know, what section it's in, but BCG, the budget coordinating group, probably needs included in that somewhere, since that's the big group that tends to 
do something with it, although with the change in government, we're not exactly sure what BCG will do. Um, and then the FinCom resident appointment seemed missing from the public engagement section with OCA. Um, I know we're in the middle of trying to figure out how that's gonna work, but it, since it has to be a rule, it, it just seemed another one okay. where we should put it in there as creating that rule and figuring out how that's gonna work. Okay. So it sounds like there's a couple things. First of all, if anything's missing, and there are tons of things missing from this, we would like that input. And again, if you could do that in track changes and or dialogue on an email and send it directly to just me. The second is directions that we would provide people for each of their committees and say, here's what we would like you to do and here is when we would like to have it. And then I'm hearing from at least one counselor, but I'm also in, hearing implied in that, is that in many ways the worksheet is what really puts the meat on the bones and makes the goals actually uh, be real. And so moving forward with the worksheets is probably our best step at this point. Okay. Any other comments at this time? This is between you and your bathroom break. <laughs> okay, bathroom break. <laughs> we'll be reconvening, if you will, at 8.16. Okay, uh, our agenda starting at 8 o'clock, although it's 8.16, is to move on to proclamations. No, I'm sorry, it's to move on to action items. Thank you. Action items. Uh, we have already done 7A, so we're moving on to 7B, which is the Inn on Boltwood. And um, is Robin Brown here? No. Okay. Um, we do have slides for this, and we'll wait for Margaret. Those slides were also included in your packet. And. So I, I can address it if you like. Huh? I can start to address it if you'd like. If you would, please. So this is a um, request to reserve a large number of parking spaces on Boltwood Avenue. Um, they would pay the $10 a day, which is the normal rental fee. It's on Tuesday and Wednesday for a, a relatively large conference that is being held at the Inn on Boltwood. And so they've requested to reserve those spaces highlighted uh, for the two-day period. And I understand they pay for them. They do. Yes. Okay. Um, are there particular questions about this one? Um, I have a question. Dorothy. Uh, when you have such a, a number of spots uh, not available, uh, is it possible to have a temporary sign to random parkers who would be caught unawares as to some other place they could go for parking just on a temporary basis? We have not done that in the past. I think because this is on a Tuesday and Wednesday, these are spaces that typically aren't parked in anyway um, at this end of Boltwood. If they were looking for a, the Main Street parking lot, then that would be a, a bigger issue. Okay. And Joe. I don't have a question. I just want to make my general announcement about, no, not about that. That the Inn on Boltwood is an Amherst College subsidiary of some sort, and my husband is an Amherst College employee, but I am not conflicted out. It, just the appearance of conflict statement. Okay. Are there any other comments on this? All right. So the motion that I'm going to ask somebody put in, uh, put out is to approve the application of the Inn on Boltwood to, serve for, to reserve 40 metered parking spaces on the east and west sides of Boltwood Avenue between the intersections of Spring Street and College Street on May 7th, 2019 between the hours of 6.30 a.m. and 7 p.m. and on May 8th, 2019 between the hours of 6.30 a.m to 2 p.m. at a cost of $10 per square per day, per space per day, for a total of $800. Is there a motion? George. That's no move. Is there a second? Sarah. 
Any further conversation questions? All right, all those in favor? It is unanimous, okay? The second next request uh, for the use of the public way is the Amory, Amherst Rotary Club Community Fair. This is the one where it always rains <laughs> and we have to repair <laughs> and we have to repair the grass afterwards. Is there um, anybody to speak to this at this time? Uh, I will speak to it. Uh, we go every year and, uh, and the children do the rides, so I love this event. <laughs> Okay, maybe then you would like to put the motion out there. <laughs> All right, here we go. Um, I move to approve the application of the Rotary Club of Amherst to place no parking signs at four meter locations on the easterly side of South Present Street, south of the taxi stand from 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. on Thursday, May 23rd, Friday, May 24th, Saturday, May 25th, and Sunday, May 26, 2019, and from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. on Monday, May 27, 2019, and to reserve 21 metered parking spaces on the westerly side of Boltwood Avenue starting at College Street, moving northerly to Spring Street from 12 p.m. Monday, May 20th to 5 p.m. Monday, May 27, 2019. Um, is so there, is I guess there a I second? call the question. Is that you, it? No, no, no. <laughs> you made the motion. Okay, great. Is there a second? Alyssa? I have a question. Oh. I need a second for the motion first. George Ryan is the second. Alyssa, your question. My question actually is for the town manager. I don't believe, I meant to double check today, but are the taxi stand signs still there? Yes. It is. They're, they're still there even though we stopped using them that way. Okay, so then the reference still works, so it works for me. Mandy Jo. So I have a question about um, two things and I don't know since no one's here to speak to it, um, whether anyone can answer them. The first one is the no parking, the four spots south of the taxi stand, what's the purpose of needing those reserved? Because if they're only reserved during the sort of fair operation, not the setup and cleanup, I couldn't figure out why they're needed. Um, so that's my first question. My second one is, have we ever explored requiring events like this to find offsite parking for the full time for sort of the storage of the loading, unloading things, because I think that's the, the purpose of this reserving of Boltwood Avenue is the storing of just the trucks that come in to unload the fare. It doesn't seem like once they're unloaded, they need to be that close for the whole week to take up all that parking. So have we ever sort of explored mandating they find places other than right next door for those things. And then I'm just going to assume they're not paying for the parking either. Mr. Brock. In reverse order, correct on the assumption. Um, in my time, we haven't asked them to seek out other locations to store their, um, their equipment. Um, and the, the first one, I'm not sure why they have the, the South Pleasant Street parking reserved. Um, I don't know the answer to your first question. Can I just point out that during the time of this, there's a lot of parking space at UMass that's not being used, and that we might want to consider that particular idea or something else. Is there anything, any other questions? Yes, Sarah. Can I make the, the very unprofessional observation that going to the fair with the young kids I mean, obviously this is not why the road is, is closed off, but I know that a lot of people park like um, behind the police station at Amherst College. There seems to be a lot of traffic, not just at the crosswalks, but you know, little kids and people with strollers. And so in some ways it makes it a lot easier for throngs of people to get safely across that road. But that's, that is not a professional opinion. <laughs> yeah. yeah, in many ways, the same way as when we do Taste of Amherst. The road is not closed, though. The road is still, at least this request is not a road closure request. That's so true. it's still travelable. That's I guess true. just because there's, because there's not parking, I don't see a lot of trolling. Do you know what I mean? Like there's not a lot of people slowly going through trying to get in or out. Okay. Any other questions, comments? 
All right, we have a motion and a second. Is there any call the question? All those in favor? That's uh, everyone, all those opposed? And abstained. Mandy Jo is in opposition. The rest of us were in favor of it. Thank you. Um, we are now moving on to the fiscal 2020 regional school budget adoption and regional assessment formula. Um, and I want to just state in a preliminary to Kathy Shane, who is going to speak on behalf of the Finance Committee, that the assessment process was agreed, was first of all discussed over a period of a couple months uh, by, with representatives from the four towns. Uh, it was agreed to by the four towns at the March 2nd four towns meeting and was unanimous, unanimously supported by all the counselors who were present. We had a quorum of seven people, as well as the members of the school committee who were there. The alternative method was not at all favorable to the town of Amherst, and we are greatly encouraged by the support of the method proposed here from all four towns at that meeting. Kathy, do you want to speak to this particular item? Are you asking just to the, speak to the assessment method? Yeah, actually, okay. it's to the whole issue. Okay. Of, this is the fiscal year regional school budget adoption and regional assessment formula. Okay, so that's what I was prepared to. Um, we held a, a briefing at the Finance Committee where we first heard from the Regional School Committee. The superintendent came and explained the budget to us and our share and the assessment method. And then we had, there was a public hearing. And then we came back and we actually had a vote on the motions that you have before you tonight. So you've got, you've got multiple pieces. First is an approval of the overall budget and the Amherst share of that budget, which is determined by the assessment method. So we are also approving an assessment method that allocates the town's share. And as Lynn just said, that goes through a negotiation every year. Um, and this assessment method, we're hoping will hold for two years. So we won't have to come back to it again next year. But there's a motion both to approve the budget and the town share, our town share of it, and a motion to improve the assessment method. Um, and separately, um, there is one other piece to this. The middle school roof needs a new roof. And right now, we are not, in the current fiscal year, the coming FY20, we will not see the cost to this, but it will be coming to us as they initially do a bond securing. And the hope is that we will get a school bond that will pay for half of the cost of it, and then Amherst share will be determined proportionately for a bond that would go for the town share, the district share, the annual amount. So we don't have an exact amount yet that we will be paying. We know the total cost of the, the roof, and we approve moving forward on going to get the grant and then allocating the shares. Okay. As Kathy indicated, we're going to be dealing with this in three different motions. Um, and in order to ask questions about those, let's deal first with the regional school budget. And that motion reads, I move that the Town Council approve the Amherst Pelham Regional School District Operating and Capital Budget of $32,167,342, and that the town raise and appropriate $16,444,279 as its share of that budget. Is, would someone please make that motion? I move that we do that. Dorothy is the moving second? I second it. Okay. Are there questions about this part of the motion, of the discussion? Okay, all those in favor, raise your hand. That is unanimous. Moving on to the next one. This is about the assessment formula. I move, the, and the motion reads, I move that, that for fiscal year 2020 only, the alternative operating budget assessment shall be calculated 
as 30% of a five-year average of minimum contributions with the remainder of the assessment allocated to the member towns in accordance with the per pupil method found in section six E of the Amherst Pelham School District Agreement. The five-year average of minimum contributions will include the five most recent years. Are there questions or discussions about this? Okay. Uh, I need a motion. Okay, Pat, a second? Sarah, any further discussion? All those in favor? That is unanimous. And the third one is the roof repair. And Kathy's explained that while this does not tell us exactly what our amount is, I do want to ask one clarifying question of the town manager. Is our, we every year in our assessment, I believe we put aside money for capital. Is that correct? That's correct. Will our share come from that that we set aside every year? Yes. Okay. Because it will be an on bond repayment schedule that will be incorporated into their budget. Okay. All right. So that's how we'll see it. That's how it will show up for us. Okay. So the motion is I move to approve the $3 million aggregate principal amount of debt authorization by a vote of the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee on March 12, 2019 for the purpose of the middle school roof repair. Is there a motion? Pat, and a second? Shalini? Yes. I, I guess I'm looking for a little more clarification. I think Lynn had a similar question, and so that answered some of it. But when the, they bond it, is, is that portion that we end up having to pay as it's included in the regional school assessment and budget that we just passed for, say, this year, even though it's not in this year's, does that bond amount come out of the town's maximum bonding authority, or is that... It, or is it not charged to the town's sort of debt limit? Is, can, can someone explain how yeah, so that all works? The way I understand it is the regional school district has its own bonding authority. This actually doesn't require you to act on it. It just, um, typically these questions would come to the select board and they would say, do we, do we need to bring it to the town meeting or not? Um, if you do nothing, this happens in, within 60 days, but we thought it was more affirmative and a, a sort of empowering by the council to actually take action on it. So it does not count against our debt limit, this question. Okay. Are there other questions? Yes, Evan. So I just want to make sure I understand what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so the three million dollars that we're authorizing would be the maximum that we could, that we would borrow for this roof with the understanding that we're applying for an MSBA grant, and should we get that grant, uh, this amount would be lower. But what we're doing is we're committing to the roof regardless of whether or not we get the grant with the hopes that we will. That is correct? Yes. And just to be clear, this is very different than the MSBA application we just voted on a couple weeks ago. Okay. Anything else? Any other questions? And just, uh, you know, just what I'd add is, there is there's a separate category of MSBA for major repairs where roofs specifically fit. You know, so it's different than building a new school. So it's, it's also not competing with the elementary school. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Uh, then call the question. All those in favor? And that is also unanimous. Okay, our next item on the agenda is engagement of an auditor for audit of 2000, FY 2019, which is the year we're just finishing up. And uh, I'll read the motion, but I specifically want to ask Pat DeAngelis, who is now chair of the audit committee, uh, to speak to this if she so chooses. So the motion is to authorize the town council president to execute the audit engagement letter 
indicating acknowledgement and agreement with the arrangements for Melanson Heath's audit of the town's financial statements and compliance over major federal award programs for FY 2019 as recommended by the Council Audit Committee. There's a motion. Pat, do you want to make the motion? Uh, so moved. Okay, and a second? Okay, Sarah? Okay, questions? Or comments? Yes, Dorsey. I just have a quick question um, that was posed to me by a constituent about this agenda item. Um, uh, and the question is whether this, and I uh, looked through this um, list of um, uh, list of items that the auditor would do, and I'm wondering if the audit would look at past appropriations to the capital budget that have apparently carried over from year to year, and whether or not. Uh, the money would be used f for the purpose for which it was appropriated, and if not, like what, where it would go? Yes, Mr. Brockman. So they do look at all of our finances prior years as well, and to look at anything that's outstanding. Uh, they can recommend uh, that older um, uh, funds be used or closed out. Uh, it's not their job to um, tell us to reallocate the funds. That's really uh, up to the comptroller, to, and she does that on a regular basis. If there's funds from several years ago, she'll be pressuring people to either spend it or I'm going to close it out, and then it re returns to free cash or wherever it, it came from. Okay. Are there other questions? Um, and Pat, can you remember the date and time when the audit committee is meeting? The audit committee is meeting on the 20th. Your, your mic, please. <laughs> I believe we're meeting on the 26th um, at 9.30 to 10.30. And at that time, the auditing company will present this year's audit? Yes. Okay. All are welcome to join us. Okay, uh, we have a motion on the floor. It's been made and seconded, uh, and this is to engage Heath, Melanson Heath, for the upcoming audit of FY 2019. All those in favor? Okay, and opposed, we don't, okay. Sonia will be very happy. <laughs> um, Item E on your agenda is the Community Preservation Act. This is the proposal that we received. Uh, our job tonight is to refer this along with the written document we are told will be coming and um, to refer it first to the Finance Committee and also the Community Resources Committee. Hi. Um, so the motion as it reads is to, re is to refer the Community Preservation Act Committee proposal to the Finance Committee and the Community Resources Committee. Um, is there a, a motion and a second? I'll move that. Mandy Jo is the motion, the second. Yeah. Pat, questions and comments, yes. Um, I just have a, a question. If it's going to two committees, um, and are they going to have to come and present to each of us separately is part of my question, and then if we have similar issues or questions. It, it's, a, it's an efficiency question on uh, two different groups of five people. Um, with some overlapping members, with by the some way. Overlap, some overlapping membership. Some overlapping membership. Uh, we would expect a recommendation from both. If there is a problem, is, if there's a difference in the recommendation, then we would just bring them to the council because the council ultimately makes the decision on this. Did you have any question about that? Okay, all right. Any other questions? All right, yes. Just for clarification, what are we asking of CRC? Just whether or not they think these are good 
projects? Yeah, it's, it, finance really looks at the financial issues, including the fact that we know that one of the projects this year would in fact bond, be bonding money. And in this case, that does go against our debt ceiling. So that does have to be considered. For CRC, however engaged they want to get this year, in the future years, they certainly might become more engaged as to whether these projects fit in with what their vision for um, the town is. I was just going to add that we would be looking at the impact, positive and negative, on mm -hmm. the town in different ways. Right. And I think that's critical. And in fact, somewhat applying the kinds of criteria that we saw in the TMAC proposal. Okay. Um, is there any further question or conversation? Okay, so the motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor? Okay, that's a referral and it was unanimous. Okay, the next two motions, um, in fact, the next two sets of motions really deal with cleaning up uh, committee charges. There's nothing startling in them, as I can tell. But the first one is around the finance committee charge. And the motion is to approve the revisions to the finance committee charges recommended by the governance organization and legislation committee. Is there a motion and a second? I'll move. OK, a second. George, and further conversation. Yes, Kathy. Uh, when I was comparing the track change to the final recommended, I only saw one thing that I thought was substantive, so I have a question on why. Um, and I know that it was actually, since I typed the sentence, it was a little bit hard potentially to understand what we were suggesting. But we were thinking that the very first time the non-residents were appointed, they would serve a three-year term, because it would be six months after we go off our term, so it would carry over into the next council, and thereafter it would be two years. This now makes it two years, so the first group will go off six months before the end of our time, and we'll be potentially appointing a new group. And one of the reasons we had that initial longer period was the idea that it takes time to learn this, but if we got new counselors on, it takes counselors time to learn it. So trying to keep people that have deep knowledge on it and you need, would need at least a year, so that first group was unusual, because afterwards you'd always have a full two years. So it's been rewritten now to eliminate that starting point being the, char the charter had it as a transition, you know, the first time. So that was my, the only thing I thought that was substantive. Andy Joe. I'll, I'll address that. Um, yes, GOL, and I did point that out in my report from, from the GOL committee. Um, GOL did remove that, that sort of line or sentence, I don't know, you know um, from the charge. GOL has made a decision that as many charges as possible, that the charges should not have wording in them that almost immediately becomes irrelevant. Um, so dates that we, we saw this with the ECAC committee and others where things are in there that only apply to the first time of appointment or the first thing that happens. Um, what GOL is recommending after having removed that from the charge is one of two items um, that when the charge is passed that the motion to pass the charge um, include could include language that says that when the non-voting member appointments are made for the finance committee that that um, that those appointments have an end date of that three years later and then when those non-member appointments, so the chart, the motion tonight to pass this charge could have that language in there, taking that so it's in the motion, it's not in the charge itself. And then the other option is when the appointments come before the council to be appointed, um, on however we're doing those appointments, um, that the motion to appoint those members um, have 
the end date being three years out, not two. Um, so, so that, because GOL's going to recommend that any time an appointment be made that the appointment come with an end date and a start date for that appointment so that we're clear for resident appointments and even counselor appointments to committees when the appointment is over, what the term is. So the recommendation is that the motion to appoint those members include the end date and that that end date be three years out instead of two years out and that potentially the motion tonight, um, if desired, can now be amended, because I think we're in the middle of the motion, to include that the first set of appointments for residents end after three years instead of two. That would be Jul July 30, 2021. Um, mm -hmm. 2022? 2022. 2022. <laughs> um, that, 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 that the charge motion could also include that, but that was the reason it was removed from the charge itself. So there is a motion on the floor. Uh, it's been made and seconded. It's to approve the revisions to the Finance Committee charge as recommended by GOL committee. Yes, Alyssa. I'm sorry, I know you've worked on this a lot, but I still think that I would ask you to go, I will vote for this, but I would ask you to go back and look at this as more of a Scrivener's thing than anything else, and I'm not even referring to the missing period after SEC, not even talking about that. In the section under the charge where it says hold a public hearing on the budget proposed by the town manager and thoroughly review it, I'm not sure why that's one sentence instead of two, and we definitely need the reference to the required forum included in that. I don't know why that disappeared because the forum is absolutely required, and it doesn't say section 5.5a, whereas everything else seems to have a charter reference next to it. And the other question I had is just in regards to parallel construction, where it starts with review any request for new appropriations. Um, in the middle of this, you're saying finance shall report back. And I think that similarly to what you did previ to the previous one, either turn it into two separate bullet points or make the sentence longer. But you've already got a heading that says finance does this, finance does that and saying finance in the middle comes off kind of weird, like it means something as opposed to just how we changed the way we were doing references halfway through writing this. So I think that's fine, but I do think it's more important in the first one where it's talking about holding the public hearing. I think it needs to be really clear that that's a required, what, what's required and what's like just pre preferred. Okay. We're accepting those as edits at this point, okay? Um, the, so the motion's been made and seconded. It's been pointed out that as the actual, we can either amend the motion now uh, that would deal with the length of the terms for the first appointees or it can be done at the time, time that their appointments are brought forward to the council. Um, either is fine, it just, you know, as long as, you know, when I would read this, I would read it as non-permissive. So now we're saying it's permissive that the first term be three years, so. Okay. Oops, we're going to vote on, I forgot my button. Uh, we're going to vote on the motion as it stands. Are there any further questions? All those in favor? And that is unanimous. And then the second, uh, motion related to the finance committee is to approve the revision of the special municipal employees section of the finance committee charged as recommended by the governance organization and legislation committee. And Mandy Jo, can you specifically speak to that? Yes. Um, the When a committee is designated special municipal employee committee under state law, there needs to be a separate vote to actually establish that committee. So we, I don't think we voted that for the finance committee the last time we adopted the finance committee, so okay. we need to vote it tonight. Okay. Any questions? So the, the motion, I need a motion and I need a second to approve the revisions to the special Municipal employees section of the finance committee charges recommended by the governance organization legislation it's committee. It's not the revisions. It's to designate the finance committee as a special municipal employee okay. committee. So the motion right. needs to read to designate. I, 
I would have thought that the charge revisions we already took under account already took care of the fact that we needed to specify that even though finance committee member, the finance committee is special municipal employee, the counselors can't have special municipal employee status. That was already, as far as I was concerned, part of the charge we just voted. It's the actual designation of finance committee as having SME status, which we're not sure we remember doing before, so we may as well do it now. Do we need a do we need a change in the motion? Yeah, what I hear, I think what you want to do is you're designating the finance committee as members, as, as special municipal employees, non-council members of the finance committee. So I, I think the motion would be to designate the finance committee as a special municipal employee committee. Okay. Is there a second? Sarah. Any further conversations? These are similar to ones we've done before. Okay. Uh, all those in favor? That is unanimous. Moving on. The Energy Climate Action Committee charge. And again, this is similar in terms of both revisions based on format, et cetera, and it comes to us from GOL. So it's to pr approve the revision to the Energy Climate Action Committee charge as recommended by the Governance Organization and Legislation Committee. Do I hear a motion? Evan, and a second? Mandy Joe. Uh, Mandy Joe, you wanna to speak to this? Is there anything specific? Yeah, so there were a couple of Scrivener things to as we've gotten this template finalized to fix that. Um, but the main point purpose of bringing this forward was for the SME status. The state law states that a committee as a, content, as a complete entity must have the status, not individuals. The way the charge was written before didn't quite comply with that. So we rewrote the, that section to comply with that so that the committee has the status and then we added that asterisk to um, clearly state that counselors by under state law are not allowed to accept that status even when they are on that committee. It's a state law thing. Um, it doesn't, this revision does not change the intent of the charge as originally written that the residents will have SME status and the counselors will not. It's just bringing it up to entire compliance with state law. Okay. And then the second motion is, I went back to the minutes and I didn't see that we'd actually voted to designate the committee as an SME committee. So that's why the second motion is in there too. Okay, so the first is to approve the revision to the Energy and Climate Action Committee charge as recommended by GOL and it's been made and seconded. Is there any further conversation? If not, all those in favor? Okay, and the second one, is this the motion we need or is it a different motion? Um, it will be, I move to designate the Energy Committee, Energy and Climate Action Committee as a special municipal employee committee. Okay, the motion, motion's been made. George is seconding it. Any further questions or discussion? All those in favor? That's unanimous. We're moving on to drinking water. Good evening. Dave Zomack, Assistant Town Manager, uh, Director of Conservation and Development. I am here uh, with a, a bit of an assist for DPW. Uh, we have some good news coming from DPW in that uh, they have received uh, a competitive grant from the state to purchase some water supply protection land uh, up in Pelham and Shutesbury. And I believe you had before you in your packet a very thorough memo by Amy Rusecki, Assistant Superintendent of Public Works. And I'd like to spend a minute or two just telling you a little bit about the grant and then take your questions. I realize that this is somewhat of an unusual, this may be your first land acquisition project uh, as town council. It's a little unusual, I realize, in your process. And I want to preface my comments by saying we're, we're under a very strict timeline by the state. Um, normally, we would want much more time to move this grant forward 
However, uh, the state has given us until the 24th of April to get all the paperwork in and close by June 30th, which is an extremely tight timeline, or they will not give us the matching 50% grant. So very quickly, I think you have in your packet the memo and some maps. Um, Amherst, as you know, has about a 40 or 45 year history of protecting ground and surface water in Amherst, as well as Pelham and Shutesbury. Uh, this is a competitive grant, as I mentioned before. We have a very compressed timeline. The award was just uh, uh, sent to us about a week ago. And we, as I said, we have to close by June 30th. It includes a local process, but we also have to go through a DEP public hearing process as well, um, get all the closing documents together, and actually purchase the land by the end of June. Um, map number one, uh, there's two maps in your packet. In general, what they show you is uh, the acquisition or the proposed acquisition of land in the headwaters um, of the Hills Reservoir, which is one of our Pelham reservoirs, outlined in, is that magenta? I'm not sure what that color is. Um, but uh, that shows, that line is the watershed land. So essentially, any drop of water that falls on the land you can see actually will end up flowing through the tributaries outlined in blue toward the Hills Reservoir. Um, this grant is of particular note because it, of the importance of Zone A. Zone A is 200 feet uh, on either side of any uh, perennial stream. So the, you can see outlined in blue is Zone 1. And this property includes some of the main tributary, which is uh, up to the north of the Hills Reservoir. I think the other notable thing on this map is that the land in a tan color with cross hatching is the land that we already own. And essentially, the goal here is quite simple. Um, the more uh, of the land that we can protect around the main waterways, around the tributaries that feed the Hills Reservoir or the Atkins Reservoir or the Holly Reservoir, the more likely we are to be able to protect this surface water source in perpetuity. We don't want development near that source of water in the form of uh, herbicides or pesticides or groundwater contamination potentially through septic systems. We have a willing seller and we've gone through a competitive grant process with the state where we have competed against many other municipalities and the state has said this is an excellent acquisition for the purchase price uh, that was outlined in the memo. So I'm happy to take your questions um, and I'll stop there. Questions? Yes, Evan. So I have two questions. Uh, the first one is just a clarification. Uh, so in the memo, there's a discussion of zones A, B, and C. Um, and the statement is the property is located entirely within zone C. Um, the map, it looks like it is half in zone A, half in zone C. And I'm wondering if that was just an error or? Could you, um, in the memo, oh, I'm sorry, on the second paragraph. Uh, Let me just review the this. Third paragraph, the yep. last sentence. Yes, I think that is a typo. Um, again, Amy wrote this memo, but the key is that um, it is A, within the watershed, and B, includes a main uh, stem of that tributary. But so, that, that blue crosshatch, that would be that zone A. That's priority, zone A, right? So this correct. does include Yes, that. And, and you'll note also the, the line coming across the top of the map uh, we didn't give you the detail, but there's actually two parcels that we're purchasing. So one of them is a tiny sliver on the pelham Shutesbury line, and then the 14 plus acres is wholly in Pelham. And uh, just a second, just out of curiosity of the, the history, is this a, uh, I guess, why, is this a property, a parcel that the town's been working to acquire for some time, or is it all of a sudden just came on the market in 2017. What's the history of this? Um, I, I spoke to Amy today, and, and part of the reason is really um, opportunity. So when opportunity knocks and you have a willing seller and you have a potentially developable piece of property, you do an analysis to see 
uh, A, you start off with an appraisal. What is, the, what is the property valued at? What is the potential threat to the property? And then um, can you acquire it using either local funds or state funds or a combination? So I think uh, DPW took a look at all of those factors and said, um, we have a willing seller. We have a property that contains a significant amount of acreage in the zone A. Um, we should try to buy this and add it to, as you can see, it's a puzzle piece on the northern section of, of Pelham. So the goal is simple. If you look at all of the uncross-hatched um, parcels, the goal would be to try to fill in those zone A parcels first. And it's a fairly reasonable price for the, um, the acreage, and that's all done by appraisal. So it's not what the owner wants, but what the appraiser says the value is. Additional question. Additional questions. I, yes, Dorothy. Okay. Uh, just just to be sure, when I look at the map, uh, if it's got the um, pinky beige cross hatching, you Amherst already owns this before this deal, or is that what we're going? Uh, then then the white stuff is what you're acquiring, or the white stuff is what you're not getting yet? So it looks brown to me, but brown yeah. cross-hatched is what Amherst already owns. Right. And that's, so that's not part of this deal, so? No, the only, the only parcel we're talking about is outlined in red on the map above. Oh, okay, very good. And it's actually two parcels. We didn't break it out okay. because the, the, the one in Shutesbury is right on the Shutesbury line, and it's a tiny sliver of land. Okay. Uh, I think Amy included the breakdown it is 0.55 acres in Shutesbury and 14.5 acres in Pelham. So it's actually two parcels. And so everything that is not cross-hatched is owned by private landowners in Pelham or Shutesbury. And we may or may not seek those lands. It really depends on an analysis uh, done by DPW with assistance from DEP and the state as to how much of a priority they are. You can see that in blue, some, some of the parcels don't include any tributaries. So those would uh, likely be lower on the priority list. And we may not even acquire those. What this doesn't show you is topography. Everything does flow toward the, the Hills Reservoir. Um, this next map does show topography. It's a little hard to read at that scale, but um, everything does flow south and then west into the Hills Reservoir. Okay. Additional questions? I do have one. Um, is this the type of thing that we then pay taxes on? We do pay pilot payments to pilot. Pelham. Okay. And I would point out that Amy did include the motion, which is a four-part motion. Yes. If there are any questions about the motion, um, I'm sure Mr. Bockelman or I could help with those. Okay. Pat, you had a question? No. Okay. Are there additional questions? Okay. No, um, I yes. Um, so the land that was in white that on the other map um, is developable by a householder, uh, uh, a not-for-profit developer or anything else. Oh, it a, could be purchased and built on. It's a great question. Um, what's key? There are many factors, and I know a question came up earlier about conservation land uh, acquisition, and, and I'm sure there'll be time to, to cover that later. But many factors go into the analysis of whether a piece of property is of value for protecting for water supply or water protection, because we, we protect land both around our wells and wellheads, as well as our reservoirs and their tributaries. So in this case, you can see that this land actually um, has frontage off of Shutesbury Road, whereas some of the other parcels don't have any road frontage. So that's one of the factors that goes into the analysis. Is it developable? It needs frontage. It needs to be not too steep. It needs to be able to have a well up this far uh, up in Pelham. Um, there, it would all be on septic. There's no sewer there. So there are a number of factors that go into the DPW's analysis. And then having a willing seller often helps. Back to the earlier question that Evan asked, 
sometimes we're working on these projects. I've worked on projects that took 20 years for the landowner to be in that willing category. We do not take land for watershed or conservation purposes or any other purposes for the most part. But um, so it can take five years, 10 years or, or more until a landowner might be ready. And again, we can't force anyone to sell to us. Uh, just to follow up or clarify for myself, I understand the parcel that we're talking about purchasing. I'm looking at the other white blocks of land which we don't own, which, so can they be developed? Certainly many of them can. It really, as I said, it goes back to road frontage or the ability of the landowner to put together based on the zoning in Pelham, based on the topography, wetlands, streams, all of those factors, if one landowner owns multiple parcels, they can go through one parcel to get to another. Um, again, most of the area up in, in, in um, Pelham has high water table. It's one of the reasons why it produces such great water um, in the Hills Reservoir, is a lot of it is wet. But certainly there's frontage development on some of the roads in Pelham and Shrewsbury. Any further questions on this? We did list this for public comment. Is there any public comment? Yes. Please come forward to the mic. Please come forward to the mic, sit down, state your name and where you live. Thank you. Hi, Amy Zuckerman, KMR 74. As a record reporter, this is interesting. I work with developers, investors, and Larry Miller, you know, Jones has been working on selling a lot of land in Shootsbury along with so et cetera. Can I just get a sense of where this is in Shootsbury and Pelham? Because I live I'm just curious where it is. I'm a little bit confused to the location. Are these the reservoirs we're looking at? Where are we? David. So this is in the very northern portion of, of Pelham off of Shootsbury Road. The Hills Reservoir is actually in the lower left-hand corner of this. Mm -hmm. So the Hills Reservoir and Holly Reservoir are very close to Amherst Road in Pelham. So this is due north of, of that area. I actually live there. Interesting. So this is where the three little reservoirs, two little reservoirs are. Yes. There you can see the Hills Reservoir. Uh, that's on the left as you're going up um, Emerst Road in Pelham. So they had to conserve the land? Is it, I'm, I'm sorry, ma'am. It's, it's, it's really public comment. I'm asking, and we're not obliged to respond. If you'd like further information, please be in touch with us. Thank you. Okay, any further questions on this? Yes. I just have a question about um, how, how much farther north from this parcel is the source of the, of the little river, creek, waterway, tributary? I'm, I'm just going by the map that was provided by DPW, but you can see that where the lines for the watershed, the magenta, if that is magenta lines, kind of will will go. It's a, it's a couple of miles maybe yeah. north of there. I don't know the exact part of the watershed. Um, but again, all of our watersheds are mapped for Atkins Reservoir, the Hills Reservoir, Holly Reservoir, for Lawrence Swamp. So DEP wouldn't even consider this grant if we were outside the watershed or even you know, just outside the watershed. Again, we're, we've been very prudent about going after parcels that, uh, and in this case, it's really in kind of the headwaters where these streams begin. So this stream is likely, it might be as wide as this desk at that point, this is, or, or narrower. And it is very swampy up there, bogs, and that's where good water often begins. Mm -hmm. It's journey south and then west. Okay. to the Hills Reservoir. Any further questions? Okay, this is a very lengthy motion. I will read it. It's the motion is required to, in order for us to accept the grant. And so the wording of it has been carefully crafted to meet that requirement, okay? Um, 
and the motion is to acquire as the Board of Water Commissioners by purchase, gift, and or eminent domain for drinking water supply protection and land conservation purposes under the provisions of General Law Chapter 40, Section 39B and 41. Two parcels of vacant land, one located in Pelham, containing 14.5 acres, more or less, and another located in Shrewsbury, Shrewsbury containing 0.5 acres, more or less, both described more particularly in the deed record, in a deed recorded with the Hampshire Register of Deeds in Book 7621, page 224. B, to appropriate and transfer the sum of 82,600 for the acquisition of such land and costs related thereto for the water fund surplus from the water fund surplus. And C, to file and authorize the town manager and in such boards or other officers as they deem appropriate to file on behalf of the town any and all applications for funds, gifts, grants, included grants of reimbursement under the Massachusetts Energy and Environmental Affairs, Drinking Water Supply, Protection Grant Program in any federal and or other state program in any way connected with the scope of this acquisition, which grants and or funds so received shall be used to repay all or a portion of the sum transferred from the water fund surplus hereunder and D, to enter and to authorize the town manager to enter into any and all agreements and execute any and all instruments to effectuate the foregoing acquisition, provided that such funds shall be expended only if prior to acquisition. The town has received a commitment for funds under the Drinking Water Supply Protection Grant Program and or any other federal and or state program in an amount equal to at least 50% of the amount appropriated under this article, which may be in the form of a reimbursement grant. Is there a motion? I so move. A second? Second. Evan, second. Further questions? <laughs> it's okay. Um, okay, all those in favor? Okay, thank you. And thank you very much. In the, in the future, we certainly will do our very best to bring these to you as soon as we possibly can. Again, our hands were tied with a very late turnaround by the state, and we appreciate uh, that DPW, kudos to DPW for getting the grant. This is what departments do is they go out and find money and right. we try to match it locally. So thank you very much. That's perfectly understandable. Um, okay. Uh, the last item under action is to actually defer to May 6, 2019, the item regarding the appointment process, process for non-resident finance committee members. This was deferred from the last meeting to this meeting. Andy's not here, and so I, the motion is to defer it again. Is there any... The mo so it's with the mo the motion is to defer to the May sixth, two thousand nineteen regular council meeting. Motion, George. Second, Chalini. Any further conversation? Yes, I, Kathy. Well, there. I assume there's still going to be time to interview people, so we can make the appointments. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. I don't. I mean, I was just. I was able to attend. Uh, the meeting today that um, Oka had, um, and they are moving right on through. Great. Yes, Alyssa. So I, I'm not going to, I'm going to assume we don't actually have a live motion that says we're deferring action on something, no. that we're just no, stating we that. For yeah, the we're just stating it. And the idea that we talked about last time was that you know OCA had their input, rules had input, finance committee had input. We want to wait for Andy to get back, and then we will make a decision as a council as Correct. to who's making those appointments. Correct. Okay. So as you pointed out, we don't need a vote on this. Is that correct? No? Okay. But the minutes will show that we're deferring this until May 6th. Okay, we're moving on to committee reports. We're now 15 minutes behind. 
And since many of you have already done major pieces of your committee reports today, I will just quickly go through. Pat, anything from bylaw review? Uh, we're working hard. Um, we're working consistently. Um, I think the group works very well, and we have compiled a list of bylaws to have the um, KP law look at. Um, we have some changes that we think are necessary, um, but they would come to the council. Evan or any, Alyssa, anything? I, I really think, um, yeah, I don't have anything else to say. Yeah. Okay. Uh, moving on, uh, Council Goals Ad Hoc Committee. We've already basically given our report. Anybody from that committee? Finance Committee, either Kathy or Andy. Kathy, no? But um, people know about the special meeting next week and the week after, yes. Right, which we've You've been made. posting as committees of the whole so that if counselors come uh, that are not on the committee, they can feel free to participate and ask questions in the same way as the committee members would do so. Um, GOL? Nothing more than what <laughs> we've already reported. Rules of procedure? No. Outreach communication appointments, Sarah? So I don't have anything written, but we wanted to just, we met uh, this morning and we agreed that OCO would take action um, Every time I go to do this, I completely blank. Um, okay, and these recommendations. Um, during our next meeting, which is gonna be Monday, April 29th, we will finalize our process for ultimately recommending town manager appointments to the town council. Because town council only has 30 days from the time the names of the appointees are filed with the town clerk to either confirm, deny, or let the clock run out, OCO will present our decision as well as our process to the full council by the council's May 20th meeting. Um, similarly, um, OCA also received the, the CAFs for the planning board and zoning board today. Um, we have scheduled interviews for these committees this week on 425 and next week on May 1st. We plan to bring forth final nominations to town council by May 20th. Okay. Yes, Kathy. So I, have, I just have a question on the second part of that. Are we going to have an explanation of what the process is and why um, in, for planning and zoning board in particular? Um, and one question I then would have of whatever the recommended people are for the committee, will the council know the full group that has applied for those positions? Will it be public information? And if not, why not? So, Sarah, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, I will start, and then if anybody else on the committee would like to add anything, if I miss it, <clears throat> that's totally fine with me. Um, so when we bring you forth names or recommendations of any, whether it's the town manager appointments, whether it's uh, for the town council to then look at, we will be presenting to you an entire packet. We will be giving you a report. Um, that tells you what our process was. Uh, we'll give it to you in a narrative. We'll give you a decision tree. We will let you, um, we'll let you know all of the materials that we used. We uh, figured out a packet to give that's informational to each person who's interviewed. You'll be presented with that. Um, interview questions are actually going to be made public. And then we will give you, um, for, for the town manager, the town manager has already uh, put out a report that we have about how he has done his process and certain pertinent information. We can't give you anything more than what the, the town manager, those are his appointments, what he's given you, but it does include a, his process and the information that he has there. Um, similarly, um, we're still, um, we will by our next meeting know what demographics we will be sending you, but you will definitely have um, a large amount of information and everything that we have used. Um, as far as I know, you will not be receiving all of the CAFs for the entire pool. And, you know, so I, I don't need to prolong tonight, but I would like to know why. I mean, in this case, the 
charter said the town council appoints, and I and I didn't think we were completely delegating, uh, even knowing who had applied. We might be delegating 13 people can't interview everybody, so I always assumed we'd have a small group doing the interviewings, going through it, but not that we, if there were 12 people applying for three slots, we wouldn't know the name list of the 12. So I would just like to know why. And then I'm, I'm also curious because the when I looked at the Northampton CAF, down at the bottom it says, if you apply, anything you put down will be a matter of the public record. And I'm, I'm assuming that we don't do that, but at least you know for the ones where we're the appointing authority. So I, I just would like a longer discussion on why and why the 13 of us couldn't know who was in the pool. And then hear the reasons that you then interviewed and came up with the decisions. I think we can't all be in the room together. Alyssa. We have been discussing this nearly every week for many weeks, and that will be part of our report to the full town council that goes with the names that we are recommending action on, whether they are town manager appointments or in the case that you're referring to, um, actual town council appointments. We are not giving the entire town council those CAFs, and we will give you a thorough explanation of why that is true in there, but we're not changing that decision point tonight based on that input. We will, in fact, be explaining all of that at great length in the narrative report. As you indicated, Northampton does have that disclaimer. We do not. We've talked about having that disclaimer in future. It does not currently exist. We have chosen not to go with the public process at this point, and so that will all be explained in great detail then. You may not agree with it, but we will definitely have a long explanation of it. Darcy. I just want to uh, say that as, as a group, as a council, we have not decided that this is the process that we want because we haven't voted on it. So um, uh, I think you all know how I feel about this by now. Uh, but I also really feel strongly that the full council, well, I actually feel that the public should receive the CAFs um, on all the appointments, the town manager appointments and the, the town council appointments, and that I don't really understand why Amherst is different from other towns that do that. Sarah. Okay, Darcy, yeah, help me to make sure that I answer every single thing that you said. Um, I, I definitely, I know how you feel. Um, we did, when, when you gave your minority report, the council did vote for us, for OCA, to go through with its process without presenting it at that time. When OCA brings nominees forward to the town council, we are going to give a plethora of information about how we got to where we, where we got to. I mean, and I think that we've also discussed the fact that Amherst has tried very hard, and this is why it took us so long to come up with this this practice is that we are really trying to be able to protect the, the privacy and I'll even go so far as to say feelings and of, of people. It's a small town to a, to a certain point of getting, of getting to the nominees. Once it's brought forth to the full council, no one on OCA wants this council to feel that they are going to just be rubber stamping anything. We want to make sure that we give you enough information that you feel informed and we fully expect if we have not done our job well and all of you think that it's terrible and you think that the names we brought forward is terrible, that's why we, that's why not only does do these names in the process have to be sort of worked out and fought with within OCA, we bring them to you guys, and then you guys can fully rip the whole thing apart, tell us how you feel, that's how we want to do it. But the, the reason why OCA itself decided to do it this way was to balance transparency, which we want, but also to have a, a good, healthy, large pool of applicants who are not intimidated by at least the beginning process. Dorothy. 
Um, <clears throat> leaving aside the particular people you're going to put forward, I guess I have been expecting that we would have a chance to vote on a policy because I'd hate to have uh, it start that committees could make major policy decisions on their own without it coming before the full council for a vote. So we, we did have a vote. When Darcy brought this up, the, the count, town council voted whether or not to get that process before or after, and, and the town council voted that they would let OCA go through with that process. So that's what we have right now. And then if, if we want to take it in a further direction, um, of course, that's up to the entire council. What I will say to you is that um, <laughs> time is of the essence. We need to have these decisions made by the, the last, <clears throat> sorry, my voice is going. In order for us to be able to discuss and get the names and then have the committee up and running for the first of July, we need to start getting all of this done. So I totally understand people's concerns. I welcome people's concerns. I would just say as we discuss it and as we're thinking about how we want to deal with this as a council, I could think two things. Um, one is taking a look at the timeline that we have and that we do want to do our job, and I understand that. And then the other is, is the way that OCA has written this is that it is a practice. I mean, this is our first time out for everybody. So none of us feel that this is written in stone. In fact, it was written into our practice and, and in our notes and how this is that this whole process will need to be reviewed. And if it's reviewed and we say this absolutely did not work and you know we want to check and we'll do something differently next time to see if privacy concerns were as dire as we thought, we, we can do that. So I'm just going to tell you where we are right now and then you can go from there. Kathy. I, I I can only somewhat accurately remember the discussion last time this came up because I believe we were having it around 11.30 or 11.15 at night. And we were asked to wait until tonight to consider the process. Um, you know, because, because, we, because you were gonna get be, getting near it. But I don't think I ever understood with, I'm gonna to separate town manager appointments from town council appointments for planning board, that on places where we were the appointing authority and picking something as important as a planning board that we would never get to see the pool. I think I understood that we wouldn't be part of the group doing the interviews, but that we wouldn't know. So, you know, if we need to wait until next two weeks from now to have that discussion again, I would like to have that discussion. That's what I'm asking for. Many towns have people run for planning board. They raise their hands and say, I want to be on it. We don't have an elected planning board, but it's a very important entity in town, um, and we were given it so steep. Steve? You know, I'm torn because I fully understand what the urgency of this is. And, but I also, so when the charter was being proposed, I had imagined a fairly public process in which candidates for the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Planning Board would, in a sense, make themselves public. And, you know, not necessarily campaign, but that, but, so we would be the electors in the same way that a house of, like a, um, the state, hmm, I'm not gonna use, I'm not gonna come up with a good analogy, but I, I, just, I had imagined a process that would be more public, that uh, people would have, the people that wanted to be on planning board or zoning board of appeals would make themselves known, and that essentially we would have an election. So it wouldn't be an election of the town, which happens in a lot of our <coughs> neighboring towns, but it would be an election mm -hmm. by, this, by this board. Mm -hmm by this council. Evan. So a, f a few things I want to address. Um, so one, this idea of the council voting on our process um, and the discussion we had last time, uh, I think we need to make clear our charge of our committee was to make recommendations to the council regarding all appointments. 
uh, we are working to do that, but I don't think that we would expect the council to vote on the internal workings of our committee of how we decide to make those recommendations um, in the same way that I wouldn't expect us to vote on the process by which rules decides what rules to put forth. Uh, we would vote on the recommendations rules brings forward, but how that committee <laughs> comes up with those rules is the purview of that committee. How we come up with the recommendations, which is part of the charge, uh, is, is our deliberative process. Um, we have been working on this since January. We have been holding a meeting every Monday, save for, I believe, three Mondays um, since early January. Every one of those meetings has been almost exclusively about this. Um, I would encourage you, if you have input onto how you would like to see us come up with that, you are welcome to attend one of our meetings. But I am struggling, sitting here after months of deliberation, to hear the ideas that people have for how we might go about doing this after we have already adopted a process and after that process has been adapted after tens of hours of deliberation. What I would ask of you as the council is to trust the process that we have adopted. And when we bring forth recommendations, look at those recommendations as far as are they qualified to serve on planning board and ZBA. And if they are, then we have done our job. And if they are not, then you can tell us that and we can figure out where to go from there. And then after that, as our committee decides whether or not that process worked, you are welcome to give your input, but at this point, we are moving forward. Sarah has interviews scheduled, um, and it would be uh, really difficult at this point for us to reverse course. And so we are meeting on April 29th at 9.30 in the morning in this room, and I would ask that if you have input onto our process, we will see you there. Further comment? Manager. My, my comment relates not to this issue, so I've been holding it off. If there's people with comments related to this issue, I'm happy to wait okay. a little bit more. Dorothy. Um, I thought that the vote that uh, what you referred to was let's the committee get started because time was of the essence, but at some point there would be something for us to, uh, that would be proposed to us as a policy that we could vote on. People ask me how the appointments are made, and all we've said is the committee is working very hard. We all know the committee has been working very hard, but I do think we need to have a clear policy that we can actually tell people so that they know how the appointments are made. Sarah. So um, if you look at the minutes from the, when we discussed this and voted on it, um, in a roundabout way, um, both Alyssa and I actually disclosed to you exactly our process. Also, if you would like to see it on SharePoint, you can see it on SharePoint. Also, I described the entire thought process and where we were going in my byline with Stan, which might be more fun to watch and listen to than actually read the minutes. And I, I totally, understand what everyone's saying. And I think just as my son always says to me, what is it with you Gen Xers? You always are so competitive and you want to check off every box. You love a, a work list, right? You love a checklist. So I think, because I know the time constraints, in order for the town council to actually have two weeks before our deadline to appoint people, right? Just two weeks to talk it out, look at everybody. We need to have final nominees, even if it's all of us together publicly, by May 20th. So I would say just think about that, and we don't actually have two weeks to, to have a process forward. So I would say if you now are feeling that you're not comfortable with the process, I would look at the time constraints and decide if you want to take it over now. Because really, I have, I have interviews, and we all need to follow that same timeline. So if you, if you would like to take it over as a committee of the whole, I think tonight's the night to do it. Steve. So here's the thing is that we're, it's all theory right now, because we don't know. You know, we don't know exactly we haven't, we don't know exactly how this process will play out. And I think that, you know, I will certainly have a different opinion. If we move forward with 
what you all are proposing, then I might have a different opinion. You know, once, once I see how this process, once the theory becomes practice, the, um, I think this is the place for this, these conversations you know, to happen because we really can't have them at your committee meeting because as far as I understand it, council members who are not members of the committee that attend, other committee members are really there more or less as members of the public. Unless I'm misunderstanding. Unless we call it a committee of the whole. Yeah. And at that point, we all sit equally. Shalini. So I just, what I'm hearing is that time is of essence, and so we're going to go through the process, and when the appointments come forward to us, we will then have an opportunity to look at the process and understand the logic, and, and at that point make recommendations to make a change. Is that, is that right? The, Can I just ask, but we will, we will never know the full list of names. We're only going to know the names that you're recommending. And, I, and I'm, again, I'm focusing mainly on planning and zoning board. Is that correct? We'll never know the list. The way the process presently stands, the names will, of the people who apply will only be known to OCA. And they may not discuss them or exchange emails about them or texts or anything else. They may not discuss them. They, they may not deliberate. That is the way the process stands at this point. Pat. Uh, it seems to me that um, you're following in a certain way the work that this, the way the select board worked. They all got to review the CAFs. They didn't talk about them. They didn't email about them or anything else. And I guess I don't feel um, the need for every one of us to know as long as there is a group of people who do know who is applying. So I guess I'm saying have a little faith in the people who've been working on this uh, and let's see how it goes. Mandy Jo. So I'm going to ask my question which doesn't relate to the process. Um, you mentioned um, ZBA and planning board. Where's, where does the process for appointing um, right choice voting commissioners and participatory budgeting commissioners stand? I know that's even weirder because you're probably going to have to work with the town manager, but I'm curious where that process stands. So in making this decision tree, we're also like working really hard so that other appointing authorities also have a decision tree, right? So we started on this knowing that this would be a template, a jumping off place, and also something for other appointing authorities to use. We would use this same, okay. So in striving for consistency, I have said I think that we should do it the same way for all the committees that we are bringing to the town council to appoint. Some people have suggested that planning and zoning are different or are special and that they should have a more complex decision tree and then maybe all the rest should be done out in the open. I will tell you, just as my own self, I am not speaking for my committee, I think that we should strive for consistency and whatever we choose, we do for every committee and board across the line because I, I don't think one is different or special from the other. So. Um, once we get through planning and zoning, which are huge, <laughs> then I believe we, they, it's, we have the decision tree and I believe we could go fairly quickly. So we're, we're moving on it. We have it. Are there further questions at this time? So the way it stands now, the, as we voted before, the process will be described in the appointment in the recommendation of the appointments for the Planning and Zoning Board. And the full council will not receive the CAFs. Not, it's not scheduled. Okay, all right. Um, Audit Committee, Pat DeAngelis. The audit committee met for the first time on April 11th. We elected um, a chair and a vice chair. 
We also, you also passed the motion that we recommended about uh, engaging Melanson Heath. Um, we and set a date for uh, presentation by the auditors, which is April 26th from 9.30 to 10.30 a.m. here in the town room. Um, we're also going to be looking at the process and developing the process that we will use um, to uh, hire um, uh, auditors, municipal auditors. There are only two in western Massachusetts. Um, and we have been using Melons and Heath, I think, for about 15 years. Um, and we are thinking that it might be time to change, but we will be sending out, probably in the fall, the RFPs to uh, encourage people to propose to us what work they would do for, for the uh, town. And um, we will go through a selection process then and move forward. But for the time being, we are staying with Mellons and Heath for this coming year. Okay. Any further comments on committee reports? Yes, Steve. Um, I noticed the. Oh, uh, CRC wasn't on here. Uh, Excuse me. My apologies for noticing that now. So, should we discuss that now or please, should we wait? Okay. Please. So, community resource. So, chronologically, we met just before the audit committee. So, we, we also met on um, April 11th. And um, we elected Dorothy Pam as vice chair, Steve Schreiber as chair. We decided to meet every Wednesday until the end of time. So every Wednesday. Um, <laughs> um, starting at, th uh, next meeting's at 3.30 this coming Wednesday. And then once school ends, we're, we're gonna start meeting at 2 p.m. So the first few agenda items, or first few meetings will be focused on, primarily on information information on the master plan, information on planning and zoning, but we'll also be considering the Community Preservation Act recommendations at this, uh, at our next meeting this coming Wednesday. And your work plan. Oh, and our, yes. <laughs> what she said. Your goals and the work plan. And our, and our work plan. Okay. She said. Are there other comments or any other committees I've and, missed. And uh, uh, President Griesmeyer is available for hire to take minutes at, <laughs> at any committee meeting. So I she did a great to, job with our minutes. I happen to show up for two meetings and as I have done in other committees for their first meeting, take the minutes. Um, okay, we're moving on to approval of minutes of the town council. Uh, I'd like to do this as one vote, not separate. So do I hear a motion? To, so I will propose the motion, we'll have the motion, and then we'll go through whether there's changes to any one of these in the order that they're listed and then accept, the, accept them as a group. Do I hear a motion to accept the minutes of April 1st, 2019, April 4th, 2019, and April 13th, 2019? Is there a second? Motion, a motion at this point. Pat, a second, George. Uh, are there questions on the April 1st minutes? Changes, corrections? Okay. Are there questions on April 4th? Changes or corrections? And are there questions on April 13th? Changes or corrections? Okay. Then the motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor? Opposed? Abstain. We have two abstentions. One is Sarah Schwartz and the other one is um, Alyssa Brewer. Okay. Um, town manager's report. Thank you. So you have, um, I won't reiterate things are already in report unless I think they're really important. First one is a reminder of the cleanup day, so I appreciate the counselors who have volunteered to be team leaders. We will have a group of counselors at each of the three locations. We encourage the public to show up and help. We've got lots of different locations where people have already um, directed us, saying there's a lot of trash or there's work that needs to be done in these very areas. So hope, pray for good weather. Uh, our community participation officers will be helping to organize that, and they'll be in touch with all the counselors who step forward to talk a little bit more about how you'd like to work in your specific area. Uh, Groff Park is, continues to move forward. That's really exciting for us. 
we anticipate um, that the Mill Street Bridge will be opened relatively soon. We've asked the state to let us know in advance. Sometimes they just sort of walk away and say they're done and the door, uh, the road's open. We'd like there to be some kind of ceremony for the council to participate in. So we're working on that. Uh, working on delivering the FY20 budget and the capital plan to you uh, prior to, by May 1st as required by the charter. Um, our goal is to again, just like you've already led the way, to have this be an electronic um, presentation. Uh, if you need or would like hard copies, we will produce that. Uh, we prefer not to, but we will. Um, but there's some people on my staff even who want hard copies, so we're, we'll be in that mode. We'll have some available if you ask for that. Um, Finance Committee tomorrow is, uh, if you're really into some of the, the details, our actuary will be here talking about OPEB, and our uh, financial advisor will be here talking about debt, really and about our bond rating. Um, it's going to be really a rich discussion if you're interested in that stuff. Um, the, um, uh, if you know the restaurant Porta, uh, they had their uh, license suspended for three days. The, our, the, the Board of License Commissioners has scheduled another public hearing or public meeting to review their license again on Wednesday at 1 p.m. There have been another series of um, uh, issues that have been identified by the police department, and so um, this continues to be a challenge for the, for the town, and uh, I think the Board of License Commissioners uh, will be, I would test, it's, since they just had them, had them had suspended their license and they continue to violate their licenses, I think they will be not happy, and depending on the testimony that they receive from the police officers. So that's Wednesday at 1 p.m. Um, earlier today, I sent you uh, my, appointments subject to council approval or not approval or no action for the Energy and Climate Action Committee. I just wanted to read the names off for the public. Um, so it's Laura Drauker, 57 Rosemary Lane, Andra Rose, 64 Amity Place, Jesse Selman, 216 Potwine Lane, Dwayne Brieger, 3 Thist Thistle Lane, Darcy Dumont, who's a town councilor, Nikki Robb, 4 Holst Road, Steve Roof, 1680 Southeast Street, Ashwan Ravik Kamar of 99 East Pleasant Street and Evan Ross, who is a town councilor. I've given uh, you, you a memo that describes the, the appointments, the process involved, uh, and a thumbnail sketch of each of the uh, applicants. And the OCA received it today. They didn't, uh, they discussed it for a few minutes, but they really intend to discuss it next week uh, as to how to handle this. Um, People talked about how are we, um, how are we managing a lot of the appointments. So it's a very time-consuming process because we, or I, I strive to interview anybody who's put their name forward to serve on a committee. Um, so uh, we've already done the Board of License Commissioners, and ECAC was the next highest priority. Uh, I am working on now on Council on Aging, Historical Commission, Historic District Commission, the Human Rights Commission, not just because they're all ages, it's because they all have needs, they're lowering down in, ter in terms of getting quorums. Uh, so those are the next four that we're interviewing currently. Uh, Conservation Commission, again, is uh, with a recent uh, pending resignation, will be near, uh, barely able to get quorum, so that's the next one that's coming up. So those, we're sort of sequencing these out just to manage the uh, interview schedules for me and for the residents and members of the Residents Advisory Committee and other staff in the committees. So that's the work plan as you will see, and I will use this um, sort of as a model for the type of memo that, you, that the OCA will receive. If you recall, the council said it can be an automatic referral to OCA, but I will follow the same process as required by the charter that I filed with the council and with the town clerk simultaneously. And that's my report. Do you have any questions? Are there any questions? Yes, Dorsey. Uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to thank you for all the work that you did on the um, Energy and Climate Action Committee interviews. Um, uh, I'm I'm sorry that the that we don't have a process where 
the council gets the CAFs, but that's not what I wanted to comment about. <laughs> um, I just wondered if you could, uh, could update us on the videotaping of, of the council committees since we've probably done three or four each week mm -hmm. since January and there's quite a backlog. Yes, so many of, <sighs> okay, it's a little more complicated. So it's not just um, video, if it, you, the council's been really good about taking over the technology and videotaping, that get, or videotape recording, I'll say, and that's been really terrific. We thank you for doing that. Then there's about an hour and a half or two hours worth of work for every one of those um, things. We don't just put them up on the, on the web. They have to edit them. They have to put a footer in or something like that. Amherst Media is, um, for the certain committees that they've agreed in their contract to do, they're willing to do that. We're in discussions with them about t doing on more, doing more. We have limited staff to do, put that kind of work. And you, as you know, are having a lot of meetings. We have some up, there are a lot of problems with it, we're still working on it. We have some up on the town's YouTube channel. That's not where people are going to look for them. We have to get a better system, and so I don't have a better solution for you at this point. Um, the person who's, well, I won't give you excuses, but uh, we are working to that. I know that's an urgency for the council and for the public, and the, because a lot of work happens at your, your committee meetings. So there are some up of the council committee meetings? Yes, but not on the Amherst Media channel because that's where most people go. It's on the town's YouTube channel because that's, that's what we have access to. So I can send you the link on where they are um, and we can start to put that yeah, out. And yeah. we don't have a good spot on, we're not doing it well on our website. There's a lot of problems. Yes, that would be helpful. I, I, I would like to have them up purely for selfish reasons because it would be really good for us since we all of these actions are interrelated that the different committees do it would be really helpful for me to be able to watch the committee meetings of the other committees um, because I can't go to all of them sure so I'll, I'll send out the link to where some of them are currently and we can put that on our website it's just not a clean and intuitive thing for the public, and I, we don't want to roll out something that, that's so um, discombobulated, which is what I feel it is now. We're not there yet, but I'm happy to share that with you. Dorothy? Well, we're going to have all those minutes posted, and uh, you know, the, the, some of those minutes, what, 18 pages, 20 pages? They're, if people want to know what we've been doing, looking at those minutes will give them a very good idea, and so I, I love the minutes. Kathy. I just, I want to comment on something completely different. On the cleanup day, I think it's a terrific idea. Um, and I'm one of your captains or whatever, uh, slave, slave labor. But uh, I had at least one resident say she'd love to just have this be instituted, that she she's regularly seeing a place where people dump trash. She goes down into a ravine, and then she doesn't know whether to tell DPW or conservation but she picks it up, she moves tires out to the street, she's a, but she said she'd be on a regular cleanup team if we, I think there's people's willingness to do activities like this. And um, I was just recently in Central Park, Central Park has a conservatory of a bunch of volunteers who help clean up the park. You know, so I think there's a way of, not just on committees where people go to sit, but the way we plant trees, that there may be a way of doing this year round. And I, I heard some people talk about, like with the schools even, you could do a spring and fall, help clean up your schools, which, it, which you know, it might just be mops and pans, but I, I think it's a, a building of community that's a, a really healthy thing. So I, I love it that we have this two hours stretch. Any further comments at this time? Yes, Shalini. Could we get an update on the Station Road Bridge beyond the the fact that we've purchased one, could we get a sense of timeline with when it's going to be installed? I don't have that. But, uh, Mr. Uh, Mooring's been on vacation, but he'll be back on Wednesday. So I'll get an update from him then. So you can, you can wait till then. Okay. Okay. Any further comments, questions? 
right, then um, we are at the point of town council comments. Um, you've already been made aware of the fact that we did receive the ECAC appointments. We had already voted as a town council that those appointments memos would automatically be transferred to the out Outreach Communications and Appointments Committee and that was done so at the same time it was received by the council. Uh, I have no other comments. Are there any future agenda items? Yes, Alyssa. Several. Um, one, just follow up for the town manager's report is to make sure that that ECAC memo is in the online packet for the public for tonight's meeting, just because it's another place to put it because people have heard us talking about it. In terms of lowering the speed limit, I was going through my email to go back to January of 2017, which was six months after the Municipal Modernization Act was passed. Um, some information has been updated since then, but I would I have several references I can provide to you in future agenda setting because it sounded like several people were interested in that and I will say that when the select board brought it up we were basically told no that's a bad idea and so um, not by this town manager so but by a staff member and so that is something that maybe now that more communities have adopted it because at that time there were only four and now there's a long list and I can give you the links that people can look at um, associated with that so you don't all have to look it up yourselves because I still have it sitting there from 2017. Um, so that sounds like a conversation that people want to have at some point. The other two things I wanted to ask about is one is looking at our council schedule. When we voted on the council schedule, I asked that we date, change the date of November 4th meeting. I thought our minutes indicated that was going to happen, and then I found out later that no, it didn't happen. And I want to, again, put in a plug for the fact that we should not meet the night before and before elections. That's just not something the select board did. It's not something town meeting did. We didn't meet on the Monday night before a Tuesday election. Yes, there's a holiday in November, two holidays actually, that makes it complicated, but we might as well get used to it now. Um, and so I would really like us to change that date, that being not time sensitive, obviously, because that's November. Um, and the other comment that has been made to me as we all talk about going about our daily lives, one of the reasons I think it would be really helpful to have those tapes available beyond the fact that we've all been making them is that I am hearing some criticism that so many of our meetings are during the day and that very few people feel like they can take the time off work to come to our daytime meetings. Nearly every council committee is meeting during the day. This was a major criticism back in the old days. If a new committee started and wanted to meet during the day, people said, oh, that's terrible. They shouldn't meet during the day. Um, and now we're all meeting during the day. So we might want to think about that as our workload evens out a little more, if there are ways we can come up with a more, with a regular schedule that isn't every single week for the rest of our lives, um, like it feels like it is now for many of our council committees, and see if maybe we can switch it up a little or different meetings can do it at a different time. I don't think it's something we need to discuss soon, but I think it's something we all need to be aware of because it is a change in the way things work. Are there other future agenda items? Evan. I don't know if this falls under future agenda items, more of a comment. Um, I, so my understanding is that um, finance committee meetings until the end of June will be posted as special meetings of the council um, for us to go to. And I think I would personally benefit from going to some of those as someone who's never gone through a budget process. I don't know that I could go to all of them. And so I'm, I'm just throwing out the idea that I'm, I don't know how organized you all are with regard to if you already know what's happening in each meeting. But it would be useful from my perspective if I sort of knew ahead of time what might happen at each and what were the key ones. So tomorrow you're meeting with the actuary and about debt. Is that like, if you're going to go to one, you should go to that one because it's really important. Or is next Tuesday your meeting? It, it'd just be nice to, having never gone through this and knowing I can't go to all of them, it'd be nice to know, you know, are there some that are more important than others? Are there some that you should definitely be at? Um, and if we even know this far in advance, which ones those would be? Let me comment just briefly by saying um, we do have a full calendar. We'll make sure that you get the updated one. But there is also some CRC meetings that we are now making as Committee of the Holes. For example, if they're going to discuss and learn about the master plan or discuss and learn about zoning, it's an opportunity for all of us if we can become available. Um, 
Kathy. And, and Paul has done us a service, Evan, if you go to the very end where he goes upcoming meetings, I just saw that he's mm -hmm. listed each of those. So on finance, you can see on May 7th that we'd be looking at public safety conservation departments. So if there were particular depart issues that we're taking up by different parts of the budget that you were more interested in, you right. that, that the content is listed there. We're meeting twice a, month, a week in May. And the other thing about finance is that we have the benefit of Amherst Media Films Us. So those tapes are up a couple days. They're, they're up really fast. So okay. to the extent you just can't make all these meetings, but you want to listen and watch the discussion, um, they're quite accessible. Further, in, furthermore, when a, after May 1st, when you see the title, you know, public safety, that means we're going to be taking up that part of the town manager's recommended budget for FY20. And that's when we'll be discussing that particular part of the budget. Okay. Further comments from counselors? Agenda items for the future? Okay. Then um, I ask that a motion be made to enter into executive session. Can, may I? So we're, have we done 12C yet? Because we were on 12B, future agenda items. At, we were kind of lumping it okay, all together, kind of but please go So ahead. I just want to make a plug, if I, if I may, before we go please. into exec. I just want to make a plug for something else on May the 4th at the same time as the cleanup, unfortunately. But this is the, um, an architectural tour of downtown Amherst, organized by the Public Art Commission. Hi, Bill. And uh, Bill was very nice to ask me if I would lead this tour. So if you're not busy cleaning up, uh, please join the tour. We'll meet right here at the front steps of Town Hall, and we'll walk down north, walk around the common, walk down North Pleasant Street, and and I'll learn a few things. So what, what time does your tour? Maybe, uh, Nine a.m. Oh, identically. I, identical. Okay. Perhaps you will do again at another time. Thank you. Um, right. Any further comments? All right. Um, I ask that a motion be made to enter into executive session for the purpose set forth in the agenda items 14A and 14B. The motion reads, I move that the town council meet in an exec executive session pursuant to the provisions of, the, of general law C 30A section 21A6 to discuss the purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property if an open meeting will be will have a detrimental effect on the negotiating position of this public body and further move that the town council meet in executive session pursuant to the provisions of general law C 30A section 21A7 to comply with an act under the to comply with or act under the authority of any general or specific law or federal grant and aid requirements. Is there a motion? Okay, it's a second. Mandy Joe's a second. And then I hereby declare that an open meeting on the purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property would have a detrimental impact on the council's negotiating position. The council will not reconvene an open session. Um, it's, and so therefore the meeting of the town council will resolve after the executive session. A roll call vote is required to enter into executive session. So I'm asking the town clerk to read the roll call. Councillor Balmill? Yes. Councillor Brewer? Aye. Councillor DeAngelis? Yes. Councillor Dumont? Yes. Councillor Greismer? Yes. Councillor Haneke? Yes. Councillor Pam? Yes. Councillor Ross? Yes. Councillor Ryan? Yes. Councillor Shane? Yes. Councillor Shriver? Yes. And Councillor Swartz? Yes. I failed to have a vote on the previous motion. Should we do that? Okay, got it. Thank you.
was no public We adjourn at the end of the executive session, but we will not be reconvening in public meeting. Thank you.